was adjourned. Okay, now we will proceed to our budget workshop. And I will let the record ref reflect that all council members are present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item, the Mayor, is public comments. We do have uh, several speakers signed up. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see you at our budget workshop. Um, I will be calling residents who have signed up. And please, if you'd like to make public comments, uh, fill out our, our green sheet. Um, I had a feeling there were a couple missing. Our first speaker is Derek Duzalo. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Um, just real quick, I have a quick presentation on the basis of, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Derek Desoglu, uh, 575 Crandon Boulevard, apartment 607, Key Biscayne, Florida, 33149. Um, I'm here to discuss with you real quick the issue of sustainability for the island. This has been something that's been going ongoing, uh, has been ongoing for the last couple of years. Um, since 2007, uh, strongly, and just wanted to give this quick presentation. If you take a look uh, globally, what's going on, uh, we have a big issue, and we're outpacing our resources. And if you fast forward to 2030, we have an increase in population of over a billion people from our current standpoint. And if you look at the statistics about what we're going to need in terms of energy, food, and water, I mean, those are pretty, uh, pretty scary, to say the least. So obviously, you know, this is a red flag that we need to take the steps in order to help prepare us for the future. Uh, a little more micro uh, snapshot. If you look at Florida, just in itself, 80% um, of the energy sources that we deal with in this state are non-renewable. Um, in terms of consumption, out of all the states in the United States, Florida is the third highest. Uh, we have, with the urbanization, a 4% rise in energy consumption per year. And in addition to that, since 1990, the utility rates have increased by 68%, which is massive. Um, population trends. Now, I wanted to look at Florida, but obviously Key Biscayne is, is where our focus is. And if you look at uh, the statistics over the last couple of years, since 1990, we've had an increase in 49%. And then the other thing, to make this relative, because we are um, an exceptionally small community. So what I did is I calculated the density of Key Biscayne, and we are actually seventh in the United States in density per square mile, excluding water. Number one is New York, number two is Boston, number five, or number three is Boston, number five is Philadelphia. Key Biscayne is number seven, which is insane. Um, and in addition to that, uh, a few years ago, I had given a presentation to the council based on our waste. We have nearly 6,000 tons of waste that are heading to the landfill each year that we could potentially capitalize on to produce energy for our island. So we're more dense than Chicago. Yes, uh, no, we're just below Chicago. Chicago's number six, we're number seven. They're around 11,000, we're just over 10. And that was based on the 2010 census, which I know we're a little higher right now, but I didn't want to put that number because I'm not 100% sure on the accuracy. We're definitely up there, though. Um, there is a silver lining. As I mentioned, over the past decade, there have been tremendous efforts in the realm of sustainability for the village. Back in 2007, there was the Village Goes Green initiative, which started to lay the foundation. Uh, in 2008, there was a resident-led committee that started to push this issue forward also through the schools. Uh, in 2013, under uh, then Mayor Kaplan, the Green Committee was established and we set up the Green, uh, the Sustainability Plan for the Village. Um, now, here we are, 2017, I think we're ready to take that next step. Um, the good thing is there's been some tremendous progress. If you look at our infrastructure, four great things. Just outside, on the other side, you see Lime Bike. Um, I saw them around the key today and I think that's phenomenal. The eco-infrastructure, if you look at the malls, we have the rear access for the golf carts. We have priority parking for the golf carts, which helps tremendously with the congestion. Also, the green, uh, green fleet integration. Um, I was here about a month and a half ago to give the presentation on the cost benefits and the environmental impact of transferring to a hybrid fleet, and of course, freebie. Now, that aside, these two statistics, I think, are pretty telling. Uh, we pulled these from the state of business report that we did through the advocacy committee from the Chamber of Commerce. 
We have nearly seven and a half million cars passing through our toll each year. And we have close to a million people. I'm sorry, that number is not visible. Uh, Bill Bags is just shy of a million people in 2015. It was 968,000 people attending. So if you look at the overusage of the infrastructure, one of the things that we obviously want to improve upon is our, is our transportation. So next step, I would like to ask the village to create a line item for their council budget to contract D squared as the official sustainability director for the village of Key Biscayne, uh, 3750 a month, which comes out to $45,000 a year. Um, for those of you that don't know uh, who D squared is, we're a local company. Our focus is sustainability. I have a background in mechanical engineering myself. And for the past eight to 10 years, we've been focusing strictly on sustainable development. Now, for a comparative analysis um, taken from Miami-Dade County, four other descriptive positions uh, that match the realm of sustainability. And if you look at these numbers, the average between these four positions is roughly coming up right now. It's right around $92,000. What I'm asking for you is half of that. So what you're gonna be getting in terms of bang for your buck, you have a significant cost savings already off the bat. All right, just a quick look at what some of the other cities, yes, I'm going. We're, okay. Your time is up. Okay, just some what, what the other cities are doing. Uh, they have their sustainability advisory boards, they've joined PACE, they're members of green building coalitions. So other cities down here in South Florida are taking those steps. I would like to assist the village in moving forward as well. Um, obviously, the values and benefits, you know, we have the uh, opportunity to save a tremendous amount of money with our utilities, lower traffic volumes, and increase the, uh, the air and water quality here in the PER and island community. Um, if you took a look at the 2017 allocated budget for the village, nearly $300,000 a year is being spent on utilities, and those are between the departments listed uh, underneath. This community center is about 67,000 square feet. If we take only, I'm going, I'm yeah. almost there. Yes. I think, can you come back and do this at some other point? Your time is up. I can't have two more minutes. Can I cut my presentation short? All right. May I ask one question? Sure. Would it make an important difference if we were to push hard to have our fleets um, run on ethanol? Is that is that a meaningful step forward? I don't think so. I don't think so. You're talking about fuel, which is a slightly renewable source because you're getting the ethanol from corn, but at the end of the day, you have to import it. So if you look at the carbon footprint from importing the fuel, as opposed to a local source like solar, where you put a solar charging station to offset the electricity consumption of the hybrid vehicle, I think it's a much greener alternative. Yeah, I'm going to ask. Katie. Um, Derek, could you get us basically uh, a plan of what you would put in place for the year? Absolutely. It was and part then, of my presentation. It was okay. in the next couple of slides. Just send it to us. In, oh, yes, and, it and, to us. and actually, in a, I in would a, invite you to do a special presentation sure, at the uh, August 29th meeting sure. so that you have the appropriate time because I, this is public this comment. Is not right. not and right. I would be glad. I, we want to hear you. Okay. So let's special And if you uh, give us the information the first, sure thing. and then we can look at it yep. before Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I'll prepare Everybody's interested. Very interested. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Susan Sawyer. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Susan Sawyer and I reside at 301 West McIntyre Street. I just stated I represent the volunteers of the Key Biscayne Trap, Neuter, and Return Program for our community cats. Since the new budget year began on October 1st, we have trapped over 45 cats um, and a number of raccoons and possums. We've adopted into loving homes over half of these cats. Um, and have taken them off the streets of Key Biscayne. This program continues to be a success for you, and we ask that you renew our line budget uh, in the upcoming uh, September budget, and we thank you for your compassion and your service to this community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tony Winton. Good evening, members of council. Thanks. I'm Tony Winton, 121 Crandon Boulevard. And first, I wanted to commend Conchita for her service and also uh, 
very congratulate uh, Jennifer for her taking over the reins as our uh, new clerk. I wanted to briefly speak to a topic that uh, Councilman Petras raised about the job duties and information, uh, because in your budget planning as you go forward, um, I'd like to once again <clears throat> suggest that you push uh, what I guess would best be described as a digital village concept. This would range from everything to an internet app uh, that people can interact with the village and various public departments uh, via their phones, such as uh, other communities have done. It could involve a lot of interactive participation with Facebook Live and making full use of social media and rich content to tell the story of the village. You are facing big initiatives from underground power lines to playing fields to the sustainability pro proposal we just heard. A lot of complicated stuff. <clears throat> and you have the ability with the right program to tell your story. Um, I would also suggest that um, you have had a few public safety initiatives that have happened in the past few months, uh, concerns that range everything from speeders to lockdowns to public safety uh, situations where law enforcement has had to get involved. And there have been instances where um, you have needed an ability to communicate directly with the residents in uh, a way that you can control the message at the very beginning rather than react to what bloggers are doing or what local media is doing. Uh, finally, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I would say that uh, this kind of proposal that you would ask your clerk and your uh, village manager to do uh, can involve a lot of departments. The, the clerk would certainly be akin to like a chief information officer in this digital age, but it also involves a communication strategy that has to be set with the manager and the elected leadership so that it's on target and everyone is on the same message. And I would just ask that you, as you consider the budget, that you make this a, an element to consider and push forward in the next year. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ignacio Segurola. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Ignacio Segurola, 81 Ocean Drive, ATE. Um, first of all, good luck with the budget. I think every little bit of support helps. Uh, you got your hands full. I have a specific comment regarding the building and zoning budget for the next year. Um, if you recall, about six months ago, we had a lot of talk about the building and zoning fees and the surplus that's been amassed. Maybe it's too early in the game, uh, but I took a look at the budget that was available online, and there really is, I, I couldn't find any mention of where the funds were going to come for different uh, departments, such as building and zoning. I believe, if I remember correctly, there was about $1.9 or a little bit more in the surplus, and there might be up to, by my count, almost $900,000 from the building and zoning budget that could be taken from the surplus and frees up money for other projects from the taxes and everything else. So I just want to ask you to take a look at that. Um, I think it's more than uh, more than ready to, to use the surplus and to get that out of the way and move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. And Thank congratulations, you. Vegeta. Thank you, Ignacio. <laughs> Our next speaker is Florencia Manero. Hi. Good evening. Um, I'm here because um, I want to state your name and address. Florencia for Manero, six seven six Frankwood Road. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Special Olympics program that we have presented previously and, uh, and we have been already talking with Todd and the space has been approved and um, to request the approval of a paid person to be running the program, even though it's a volunteer program, given the sensitivity and the needs of those kids. Uh, we have already a lot of volunteers uh, signed up and lined up to, to cooperate with the program, but we, we believe that for it to succeed, we need someone from the community center to be trained to take in the, the, the lead of uh, the sessions. So that's my request. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Have you discussed it with Todd? Yes. <laughs> Our next speaker is Sally Brody. Sally Brody, 180 Harbor Drive. That was kind of fun. Today at, the, today at the community center, we had 15 ladies with sewing machines and scissors cutting squares to put together, with your machine, to put together a fidget blanket for Alzheimer's 
and also dementia patients. Super successful thanks to ASK and your support of ASK, number one. Number two, we need a program from similar to the Easter Seals program that Christina Biggers, and we're so glad to have her as a volunteer to head this, put together a Easter Seals program that will work with <coughs> Alzheimer and dementia patients at our community center. It's gonna start small, but it's gonna get big, 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 like everything on Key Biscayne starts small, gets big, 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 big. You saw the population. Anyways, and before I sit down, I wanna remind all of you about that outdoors exercise equipment. <laughs> Please don't forget it. It's so great because we're all getting flabby. <laughs> well, I am. So. And also, monies for uh, Susan Sawyer's cat program. It is excellent. She's saving a lot of cats and a lot of persons that don't like cats running in their yards. She's neutering them. And you know, those boys are only after the female cat. So if we get them neutered, we'll be home free. Anyways, thank you very much. Wonderful council. Wonderful clerk. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally. And manager. <laughs> Our next speaker is the Key Biscayne Historical Heritage Society. Hi. Um, Hi. Good evening. My name is Anna Rivas Vasquez. Oh, Okay. And your address, Vicky. Okay. Um, as I said, my name is Ana Rivas Vasquez, Vicky, to most of you. Uh, I'm the current president of the Key Biscayne Historical and Heritage Society. Um, essentially, we, over at the society, we have really 40 very active members and 200 other <coughs> individuals that basically participate. Some of our board members are actually some very, um, Brad and Frank and Father Libby. Um, this year, we have a very ambitious pro um, program. But one of the things that I'm more excited about is the fact that we have a juice section. We basically feel that it's very important for the youth or our community to participate in the history of our island. And basically we have uh, a member of the board, Nicolicia, the basically high school student that has been very, very interested in participating um, as a youth division. So that's the new thing that we have. We have some other uh, rather ambitious agenda this year. Uh, basically it includes the new historical trail map, a holiday newsletter, lecture on Nixon Gears, lecture on Key Biscayne Bay, lecture on local schools, civic engagement workshops, uh, as I mentioned before, the youth group, assessment of the Calusa Playhouse, interest, interest in it, an scavenger hunt, um, and survey of the residents' interest. So we really have quite a number of things that we're very interested in getting involved this year. Um, the contribution of the village um, of Key Biscayne uh, to our budget is $15,000, and we're really very, very grateful for all the support that you have given us throughout the years. Um, basically, the contribution of the village to our society went to uh, the storage unit to protect, preserve historical archive that include photos, books, newspapers, memorabilia from the Winter Bi White House, the old Sioux, Cape Florida, Crandall Park, Calusa Playhouse, Incorporation, Madison State, and so on and so forth. Um, it also actually goes to help us with the lectures on Cape Florida, Nixon, and Key Biscayne that we're planning on having, newsletter, reminders of what happened and where it happened and who was there, and the website and database. So that's where we're hoping that we will be able to basically do this coming year. And thank you so very much in the interest of time. I'm going to leave this here. Are there any questions for me? Thank you. Keep okay, going, Vicky. Yep. Keep going. Thank you very Frank much. Frank is going to retire and archive all the documents, everything you have, yeah. lovingly, with cotton gloves. And you, you can rest assured that nothing new will ever happen. <laughs> Thomas Crawley, Jackson Crawley, Ella Crawley, and Ava Crawley. I think we've got a whole family coming up.
Your name Hi. and address, please. Okay. Hi, I am Thomas Crowley, and I'm and I am I live on 38 Southwest 22nd Road, and I'm here today to speak to you about my our avatar group. Hello, my name is Ella Crowley. I live on 38 Southwest 22nd Road in Miami. Avatar's mission is to educate kids peer to peer about the importance of recycling and con. <coughs> Conversing on natural habitat while exposing them to leadership, time management, website design, and budget skills. I am, a, I am April Crowley, and I live at 38 Southwest Second Road, Miami. Invite kids from the teacher scene and greater community to talk part in our we want to be actionable by doing beach cleanups and recycling at Bill Bags. We hope to plant native trees to conserve our natural habitat. We want to find natural ways to contain mosquitoes. We have fun with events like the Beach Olympics. Our group consists of 33% of 33 second and through fourth graders, 33% fifth to eighth graders, and 33% ninth to twelfth graders. Recent events and budgets. Monthly beach cleanups, September, October, and November. November 4th, Beach Olympics turtle hurl, hurdles with Lou Dodson. 40 participants, $450 budget. June second, recycled recycled art and native plants. Fifty participants, five hundred dollar budget. June ninth, archery and native plant day. Butterfly walk at Bill Bags with Avatar group leaders. Upcoming July second, third, or fifth, scavenger animal hunt or Muslim woman of South Florida guest speaker event. We also hope to do tree planting with the group from Mahogany Youth. Budget continued. Avatar relies largely on friends and families spreading the word to recruit members. The bulk of the costs associated with the program are from its events. Avatar will pay for, for participant transportation and for an event coordinator. Avatar also buys shirts for its members. We are here to ask for a, a line budget item of $4,500 to continue our group of, of the avatars. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Biggers. Are you also the 4th of July parade? No, City Theater. Oh, no, I called you, but I thought you said that you had two. Oh, I do. Then there's the Brain Club. Okay. <laughs> That's the new one. Um, hi, my name is Chris Biggers. I reside at 526 Allendale Road, and um, I am here to represent City Theater. Susie Westfall couldn't be with us tonight. She's in the middle of um, our high school program for young playwrights. Um, Okay, so we're requesting the renewal of our yearly funding, which is, has been 15000 And City Theater, through what you guys have become familiar with, City Shorts, or what used to be called Island Shorts, um, as well as Shortcuts, has become an integral part of Key Biscayne Life. Um, we also have a program, all right, so City Shorts, um, which is in January, this coming January 2018, will be our fourth season that we produce um, City Shorts on the island. Last year, two of the three programs, Saturday, Friday and Saturday night, were both completely sold out. Um, Sunday was Super Bowl, so we had a little conflict. <laughs> um, Key Biscayne residents um, have become, you know, have started looking forward to this. I mean, I get stopped all the time. Are we doing it again? Are we doing it again? 
Um, and then what you might not be familiar with, because we have not asked for funding in this, and I'm not going to, um, but for our second year, Shortcuts, which is our middle school performances focusing, focused on anti-bullying, has been performed at Mass Academy. And for the first year this year, we performed the same show at the Cuba Skane Community School. Um, she, the president of the school loved it. She just thought it was fabulous. Um, and we had partial funding for the shortcuts come through donations that were given to us during the summer or the city shoots performance. Um, so we would just like to ask for the renewed line item. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a representative from the fourth of of uh, Fourth of July parade. I guess that's me. And that's you. Um, my name is Kaylin Kaplan. I live at 370 Palmwood Lane. Um, Caitlin, is this the first time you speak in front? Yes, this is. The Congratulations. First time. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, <laughs> if avatars existed, you would have had earlier opportunities. No. <laughs> yes. So, um, as you all know, every 4th of July on Key Biscayne, there is a wonderful parade. It's been going on since 1959, I believe. Um, so I'm here to request funding, continued funding from the village for this parade. There's so much that goes on um, behind the scenes of the parade. I'm newly a committee, committee member, and I'm shocked at how much behind the scenes work there is. Um, the funding from the village usually helps fund things from the marching band to the steel drummers to the stilts, the stilt walkers, just crowd favorites that everyone loves every year. Um, so uh, also it helps fund the t-shirts, the marketing and promotional expenses, the soundstage and setups. Um, I'm 22 now and I've gone to the parade every year of my life except for one and it's a huge part of the identity of Key Biscayne I think and it's a very important thing to continue. So. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Chris Biggers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So this is um, a presentation uh, regarding what we're calling the Brain Club. Um, we're requesting f we're requesting new programming at the community center um, to run this service. Um, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a short overview, then I'll talk a little bit about what Easter Seals will provide to run this, um, and then review some survey results. Uh, what was done through our, our survey. Um, so the brain, the brain club will provide an array of meaningful activities to those attending the program, and these would be patients suffering from various forms of dementia. Um, the activities would be reflective of their past history, and these would be reviewed and analyzed by um, a social worker as well as a recreational therapist. The program will also provide a break to the family members who are in most cases caring for these members. Um, and it will, um, uh, the program will be administered by Easter Seals. So we really have nothing to do with actually running it. All we're gonna be doing is providing the space and the facility to run the place. Um, initially what we're looking at is to do this two days a week, four hours a day at the community center. And we're anticipating um, the request of the clients to pay a fee. Um, I did a little research <clears throat> and to do, the program is run over at Easter Seals in Miami and they actually charge between 40 and $100 on a sliding scale for a full day of activity. Um, I'm thinking we could charge two hundred, well, about $20 a day per, per client. Um, there, I'm not going to go into detail here, but the staffing uh, basically would have a social worker, recreational specialist, a registered nurse, and these would all be part-time, um, you know, a couple of hours through the month. Um, but the full-time people would be two certified nursing assistants trained in the provision and care of therapeutic activities. Um, some of these activities include exercise, laughter, yoga, which I'd love to learn, <laughs> word games, crafts, guided painting, music appreciation. Um, the cost, the actual cost from Easter Seals for a year to run this is about a little bit shy of $25,000. Um, but like I mentioned before, we, we feel that we should charge for this service. So we're thinking $20 per person attending. And if we were to get the maximum, which is their, this program, the way it's laid out now is for 10 maximum per day, um, that could potentially give us $20,000. 
And how, how would you use that money? I mean, well, I think, okay, so um, this is just survey results. I'm going to skip over that. But what we're basically thinking is that um, I want to, between now and September, or the, the August 29th meeting, um, I want to go literally out to the community to get more confirmation on how many people we actually think would take play, you know, take part. I mean, I brought this up at the, um, the book club, senior yoga, everybody says it's a great idea, but they're obviously not the people that are gonna use it. So I need to do some more digging. Um, one of the ideas is to go do a presentation in front of the condo president's association or council, um, you know, to follow up with people living in the condos. I would run an article in the Islander, um, basically with my, inf you know, giving my contact information, and then talk with other people that have, you know, that we know um, personally that have had this situation in their family. Um, so, like I said, by September, I would come back to you. Yep, I would come back to you with actual numbers and either withdraw my request or move forward with it. Thank you very much, Chris. Our next speaker is a representative from the Key Biscayne Community Foundation on the local transportation project. Um, is that you too? No? No, it's not me. Uh, can I make one correction? Yes. On the 4th of July budget presentation, it said that we were requesting 15,000. We're requesting 30,000. We only really ever use 15,000, but just in case, we're still requesting the full amount. Uh, Thank you. And usually what happens is we front that money and you reimburse for the half because you are fundraising. We, we actually front the money and then you guys reimburse us. So we can- Well, we, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm apologizing in advance. I, I wasn't thinking about public comments, and we were we had prepared for the the workshop portion. So we probably will go over on a couple of these. Just feel free to stop us. Um, the local transportation initiative. Can you state your name and address for the record, Sorry. please? Melissa White, 370 Heather Lane. Thank you. Cliff Brody, 180 Harbor Drive. The public philanthropic partnership between the village and the Key Biscayne Community Foundation started in 2015 by initiative of council member Michael Kelly and KBCF donors Ed and Amy Easton. The idea was to facilitate transportation and ease traffic around the village using electronic, electrics, low speed vehicles. Look how happy everyone is. <laughs> Especially and, back to self. <laughs> yeah, right. In 2015-2016, the village funded the operation for $198,000 for two vehicles and two drivers. In 2016-2017, the village funded three vehicles and three drivers for $252,000. This cost will be offset with advertising revenue. The KBCF provides all administration of the program. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs> Some of these numbers are going to be pretty astounding, I hope, to you. They were to me, really. Over the last six months, Freebie has carried 26,561 passengers. Wow. That's about 147 a day on average, or 12.25 passengers an hour. Um, the projected re uh, ad revenue for uh, 2016, 2017 is $32,000. So it's really pretty astounding. And right now, right now, the numbers are even more amazing. Uh, last, the last, last week, the week ending June 14th, we carried 1,402 passengers in a week. So it's hard to re relate that exactly to how many cars we're getting off the road, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's right around 100 cars mm -hmm. a day we're getting off the road in three weeks. Um, and for, for historical information, this is our second vendor. Um, we worked with a vendor last year. Unfortunately, there were some uh, services they couldn't meet, and uh, the cost was getting too high, so we went through the process of finding another one. Um, we've been working very uh, closely with Council Member De La Cruz. Um, he brought in another vendor as just an opportunity to see if we can keep up the service and the demand. So um, we're constantly looking at, out to make sure that this is the best service possible. Uh, the next phase, and this is, is what's on the agenda, um, it will 
the annual cost will be 170,000. In addition, it will be reimbursed by CITT funding. Um, so it won't be paid for and it won't be an increase to the budget. It's using two new low speed vehicles that are ADA equipped to do a, a circular route. And then when they're not running that route, also provide on demand service. Um, we're waiting until CITT funding increases their scope to, to refund on demand. So we're going to start it as just a circulator. And that is it. Any questions? No. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Just what if they're circulating, when will they not be in service? Um, the on demand program runs 12 hours a day. Uh, the circulator program, we're looking at 10 hours a day. We don't think it needs to be on the road as much as the on demand. The only question would be if the CITT accepts, you know, we'll call it mixed use or. I've got an update on that. Okay. And, and just so you're aware, this is a program that the foundation took on. Um, we are not paid for our time or services to this program. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Melissa White. <laughs> We're going to do this together. <laughs> um, this is the foundation's uh, presentation, and I was just uh, Raul was kind enough to show me the budget. There is a mistake for last year. Uh, the, our line item of 125,000, we did not go over. Obviously, uh, or as most of you know, and those who don't, I'm happy to meet with and explain. Uh, we are a charitable umbrella to many groups that would have to otherwise incorporate and administer their own projects and programming. And there must have been a coding mistake that I, on our end. So. We did not go over for our funding at 125. The Key Biscayne Community Foundation, our mission is to enable, facilitate, and empower residents to make a positive difference in the local, greater, and global community through programs, grant making, fiscal sponsorship, and community leadership. I'll let you do it. The Key Biscayne Community Foundation connects people who care with causes that matter. The foundation allows residents to give their time, talent, and treasure in order to make a positive impact in our local and greater communities. These are just some of our partners. In order to try to simplify something that is complex, we, we broke down what we do into four categories. Community advocacy, community programs, grant making, scholarships, and charitable uh, projects. The first two are ones that the village is directly involved in. The last two are ones that our donors are directly involved in. So um, most of the, the, all of the village funding goes into the first cate two categories, not the last two. This is an example of our uh, 2016 budget, an overview. Um, we try to run a, a mean, lean ship. So for our $2,864,000 budget, 9% uh, went to overhead and operating. That includes three salaries, auditor, attorney, bookkeeper, office expenses, and insurance. As a foundation, we advocate for what's in the community's interest, and these are some examples of what we advocate on behalf of. The village contribution of $125,000 goes into these seven, eight categories. The percentage of the $125,000 in each of the categories. We're going to, the last slide was on citizen science. Ramya, our coordinator, because it's such a robust program and it really could be its own nonprofit, is going to go into a deep dive on what we're accomplishing through citizen science. Village of Empathy, civic engagement, youth development, and community building. The mission is to create a village of empathy through an academy of civic engagement, a sister city initiative with Liberty City, and evidence-based programming designed to develop empathy and stop bullying. 
Our vision is a community that understands the rights and responsibilities of citizenship in order to create current and future leaders, a population of youth that are empathetic and desire to make a positive impact on the local, greater, and global community. And the objective of the Village of Empathy is to create civic engagement and social change agents. <coughs> Some examples of programming, anti-bullying, to continue the work that was started by the mayor with ADL designation of No Place for Hate. We have added character and value training through books, activities, and plays. Sister City Initiative, um, Cradle to Career Impact in Liberty City, directly impacting their youth through food co-op every month that was started by Pat Molinari, wellness in the schools at Charles Drew Elementary, as well as Keep It Game K-8. through eight. Back to School Supplies for Children by Chief Press. Toys and Turkeys for Children and Seniors by Chief Press. And 400 <coughs> Cubist Gainers participate annually in the Sister City programming. The Key to Giving programming supports residents giving their time, talent, and treasure to 12 nonprofits. Um, Village of Empathy programming. Kaylin has developed my KB story um, at the request of the mayor, which will add to what is already a pretty robust program. These are just some examples of the work we're doing. And then obviously <coughs> our work with Ask Club is very important. We see our seniors as um, a huge part of, of our community. They've given through the years and we feel it's important to give back to them. That's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Any questions, feel free to meet with me. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Caitlin. Rumia? All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ramya Sundram. I live at 4223 Southwest 13th Street in Miami. Um, I am the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Um, obviously, I'm here to uh, hope that you all continue funding us. Uh, we've extended our programming quite a bit since last year. Uh, since I, I started almost exactly a year ago now. Um, our mission is to have citizen and professional scientists monitor and protect resources and to share information on the most critical natural resources of Key Biscayne and Virginia Key. And we say critical natural resources, but really we find that all the resources here are fairly critical. You take one out and it affects all the rest of them. Um, this is a list of, um, I hope, all of our uh, uh, partners. Uh, we have a few dozen. Um, they, they help us to uh, create more environmental programming and extend our audience outside Key Biscayne. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. These are a lot of, uh, several of our um, environmental programming to, um, that we use to uh, promote environmental awareness. Um, some of these I'll go into a little bit more in depth and a few of them I'll just kind of touch on. Um, I wish I had the animations to this. <laughs> Um, our newsletter reaches about 1,500 people. Uh, we send it out quarterly, and it's um, put together by our chief scientist, Bob Molinari, and myself. Um, we also uh, try to host new fishing clinics, which uh, teach young people about uh, the local fish species that live around here, and also how to properly handle uh, fishing gear, how to dispose of it so it's not going to affect wildlife, and also um, how to follow uh, management rules when it comes to fishing. Um, we created a butterfly garden a few years ago. Um, I'm hoping that we can maybe create a few more around the key um, and also um, encourage people to plant, um, plant, to plant uh, different types of plants in their yards that also attract butterflies. Um, I, we hope to also have uh, nature walks, nature trails for bird watching and things like that. Um, we have a number of different restoration projects. Uh, Rescue Reef, I'll touch on a little bit more details later. Um, we uh, are going to be having an invasive species removal project a little bit later. Uh, we have beach cleanups, mangrove cleanups, uh, seagrass restoration, all kinds of things like that, and then those are monitored. Um, we also occasionally work with Global Ties Miami, which is sponsored through the State Department. Um, last year, in July, we uh, had a group from Azerbaijan, a group of scientists from Azerbaijan come visit. Um, they were told all about the citizen science program, and, uh, and then they also came to uh, the Rosenfield School for a tour of the coral lab there. Um, that is actually how I met Melissa, because I was working at Rosenfield at the time. 
Um, and then since then, we've also had another group of scientists from various countries in Africa come, and I spoke to them about our citizen science program. They were specifically looking for different grassroots ways of um, creating uh, citizen science programs in their, their own countries. Um, the key challenge is uh, sort of an extended science fair that is a uh, key-wide and involves all of the schools. Um, it, it was fairly large this year, one of our biggest years. We had nearly 1,000 students participating, uh, about 400 finalists. We added a new category so that we could have more students that um, if they live on the key but go to school off the key, they could still participate. Um, and students who uh, were in a class on the key but their teacher didn't want to participate, they could still participate. Um, we created a, a competitive science uh, report for juniors and seniors. Um, so that way it's actually, um, it looks better when they're applying for colleges. If they won a competitive science award, it looks really good. Um, so I wanted to definitely touch on that since they're the older students. Um, our theme followed our um, EPA grant, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and uh, the uh, photos that we received this year, I just wanted to add this in. We had such a great turnout that we made these little photo books for like all the kids and uh, they're really cute. Um, these are just some pictures of some of the, the winners and some of the projects. Our EPA grant, we received $91,000 from the EPA and we have a little over $30,000 in matching funds that we put in. Um, it's about water quality and shoreline conservation. We have a number of subgrantees underneath um, that, that fall under the EPA grant and they work on different environmental programming and um, uh, workshops and uh, water quality testing and all kinds of different things. We've also been able to hire a few interns to work for us this summer um, under the EPA grant and help with, um, with working out all of these things. And uh, uh, this, these are some pictures from uh, beach cleanup at Bill Bags. Um, we received a NOAA grant last year for sea level rise. Um, we received $15,000 from them and we also had matching funds of $15,000. Um, we were able to hire uh, um, Coastal Risk Consulting to perform a vulnerability analysis and come up with a sea level rise adaptation plan. We had two public town halls and two workshops on flood risk management, which were hosted by AECOM. And um, all of our information we made public, it's all on our website and was recorded. And oh, this was actually, I added this in because it was one of the pictures from the key challenge that somebody submitted. He called it road surfing. <laughs> um, reef restoration. Um, we worked last year with Rescue a Reef, which is a nonprofit um, from the Rosenstiel School, and uh, we made it free for key residents. Um, basically what they do is they have a coral nursery and um, they outplant corals. They gave us naming rights to the tract of coral where we are planting and we plan to continue to make this an annual event. We're gonna schedule one later this summer. We'll keep planting on the same tract of coral and hopefully name it so it'll be like Key Biscayne's own reef. And over the years, each year, we can see like how it grows. Um, just quickly, this is what it looks like um, on the left of each of these pictures is what they look like when they're outplanted. And after one year of growth is on the right. And that's what they look like. Hopefully, eventually, we'll, we can actually have a thicket, which would be amazing. Um, cool. So we also had a number of, I'm almost finished. <laughs> we also had a number of lectures last year. Um, and they covered a number of topics from coral restoration, uh, lionfish invasion, um, currents in Biscayne Bay, plankton, climate change, um, using technology and citizen science together, and marine debris. Um, these are just some pictures from the plankton one. Plankton is a lot more interesting than people realize. Um, plastic pollution, I just wanted to show you this. Um, the picture all the way on the left, those are actually, each one of those vials is stomach contents from deceased baby sea turtles. On the right, we have um, a hermit crab that grew too big to get out of that, that bottle. And uh, last, um, our key challenge hours has um, almost doubled since last year because we increased our programming. Um, the project coordinator hours are my hours. I'm now a full-time project coordinator. Um, our annual insert intern support, um, we have three interns this summer and two next summer. And uh, marketing and multimedia hours about 66. Um, all of these are almost double from last year. And then this is what we hope to do um, upcoming um, this uh, summer and the following year. And, you know, we're still coming up with ideas, so hopefully we'll be able to do a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Inspirational. I really encourage, and I see so many residents who go to the, the different uh, talks and, and programming. It really is a treasure to have this here. Thank you. Oh, there um, is also, just sorry, quickly, um, we have a water and energy um, saving workshop this Saturday. If anybody wants to go, I have flyers. Thank you. Our next speaker is Don Ellisberg.
Hi. How are you? I'm Don Ellisberg. I live at 177 Ocean Lane Drive, apartment 1111. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Condominium President's Council to make a very few remarks. And because nobody in their right mind should try to follow Melissa and her uh, <laughs> juggernaut, <laughs> uh, which has brought great, great uh, benefit and, and, uh, to, the, to, the, to the village. And I, I have to commend all of the, the stuff that, that they do. I also want to uh, wish Conchita well and Thank you. congratulate Jennifer. I want to just take a couple of minutes to talk about the budget. It is a budget workshop. This is about the only chance anybody, I think, to comment generally on the budget, unless you wait till September when it's crash banging through. Um, our organization and our condos and so forth are not, we don't come and ask for assistance. Now, we're not here for monetary assistance. Uh, we are users. We are, the, we are the consumers of what you folks do in all of the programs. We're, you know, we're hopefully the beneficiaries of a lot of what you do. What I have asked for, I mentioned several times in recent years, in terms of my own budget experience at the federal, state, local, and nonprofit level, uh, what I we have trouble understanding with this budget. I think it's obviously a proactive budget. It's not regressive. It's not. Any of those things you can read about in the newspapers every day these days, it's very positive and a lot of things that are going on more than anybody can even count. But what, what doesn't come out of this budget on any of the departments is what do you get for the money? What are the, you know, what are you, what are the deliverables on any one of these departments? whether it's in terms of uh, uh, enforcement or permits or uh, whatever it might be, or, or numbers of children uh, served in the sports or numbers of adults served in the community center. It's, it's what, what are we buying that I find I have had to do in almost every other budget I've dealt with in my career, and I come here and I find that that really doesn't happen uh, about two years ago, they tried it a little bit. And I think it's something that's missing in being able to judge what are you doing, you know, what are you getting for all of this money. And it also, <coughs> to do that process, you also have to analyze what you're not getting. What are the needs that you can't meet, or what are the needs that you would meet if you had more money? Uh, and my particular experience that I want to raise is that uh, a number of us uh, volunteered and got involved in the whole uh, business, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, business planning, zoning department, and looking at the permitting process and so forth. And the experience that we had was that there were no real numbers of what you accomplished by how many people you hired. What what were you expecting to do with what you had? Even if you are in a, have an enforcement program for building inspections. What do you really want to accomplish? How many can do? It? So I'm just here to suggest that somewhere along the line, that process, that budget process of trying to understand what you're getting for the bucks you're going to spend ought to be put somewhere into this process. I know it's difficult, and I'm not, I'm not uh, taking shots at anyone because you know it's a very complex process, and doing anything with the budget is a complex process, but I have uh, our, uh, when we when we our organization meets from time to time, we do. That's sort of the questions we get from a lot of the presidents. Well, what does this mean? What are we doing? What are we getting out of it? And uh, we have been supporting all of your big initiatives and want to continue to support your big initiatives. But we're suggesting that you could uh, you might have a better shot with this huge budget if you had more of understanding of what are the deliverables the village is going to get from what you're spending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Glenn Waldman. Good evening. Glenn Waldman, 240 Woodcrest Road. 
Uh, most of you I know quite well, some of you I don't. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Youth Advisory Athletic Board, and I look forward to coming back in August and September to talking to you about some very important things. I'm here tonight because of a user fee or a, I guess, a surcharge that um, Mr. Gilbert asked Todd to put together as something for you to consider as part of the budget. And I, I don't know if you've seen the numbers or not. And that's something that we've struggled with at the Athletic Advisory Board to try to determine if there's a way to do this that works. And we haven't yet come up with anything that works. However, in terms of what Todd did, and obviously he was doing what he was asked to do, I don't have a problem with it. My, my strong concern is that what this will lead to is simply just a pass through to the kids. And if we put this user fee as it's currently um, projected to be done into play, that's going to mean is everybody's uh, cost of, of participating in every sport is just going to go up. And I know that's one of the charges that we've had and we continue to have is to try to make sure that we keep costs down, keep the, the amount of the services we provide, the sports and the opportunities for the kids as good as we can do. So um, we will be meeting on Monday. We will have another meeting in August. And um, I know the budget won't be dealt with officially for some time. And we're going to go draw, uh, roll up our sleeves and see if we can come up with something. But in terms of just a, a pass through that such as this is, I'm really concerned that all this is going to do, like I said, is just increase the fees for each sport. And I don't think that's the answer, and that's what we've been trying to avoid. So I just wanted to, to share that with you, and we will go to work and see what we can do. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Do you do an analysis of what people pay to participate in our sports programs versus in other communities? Do you have any idea? I do. And, and for most sports, we're, we're, we're certainly not more. Um, in a lot of sports, we're less. And that's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to keep it less. Um, and, and for example, soccer, which will bear the biggest brunt of this, and I'm not here to defend soccer or otherwise, um, they are a little below what the Doral's and the others who have very competitive programs currently are charging. If we're going to hit them with $40,000 or $80,000, I think is the number that they're going to be hit with based on this allocation, uh, I, I suspect that it will go up. I know it'll go up, and it'll put us above or equal where now we're a little below. So um, right now we're competitive and better and we'd like to keep there if we can, but I understand the need for revenue, so we need to see what we can do. But I just wanted to share with you my concerns about a straight numerical uh, tax, if you will. Thank you for your time. Can you Thank you. Make sure, make sure that I'm noticed for that meeting. So I, I, we have a meeting Monday night. Okay. Would you like to come? Yes. Good. I look forward to it. Thank you all very much for your Thank time. Thank you, Glenn. Our next speaker is uh, Ed Stone, Ask Club. Uh, Ed Stone, 1121 Crandon, and uh, I was very proud to tell you that how many years ago, 25 years ago? To, I was, as a clerk, 21. It was, I was part of the search committee that brought our wonderful clerk into, into place, so thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Ed. We did a great, we did a great job, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> you did. Okay. You did. Um, we're talking about the Ask Club tonight. Um, we're not really asking for much more than we've had in the past. Um, I guess you all know that the S Club is the uh, organization for the seniors over 50. We work together to provide a wide range of activities that allow seniors to continue living independently on the key. The S does this through social events, monthly luncheons, trips, tours, as well as effective exercise programs. The uh, S Club serves hundreds of Key Biscayne seniors through programs, events, education, lectures, and workshops. And these are pictures. Um, you know, if you want, the newspaper has really been pushing the senior world lately. I don't know if you've all seen it, but today we just had a walking the woman who, uh, Nyad, who swam from Cuba to Miami or, or to Key West, um, was pushing another walking program. So, I mean, what we're here for is to help us all get older. I know none of you feel that you are, but um, you're, we're all getting there. Um, we have physical fitness, enhanced fitness, matter of balance, pickleball, swimming. We have social, emotional, and engagement opportunities, lunches, social events, field trips, um, mental and continued learning opportunities, lectures, tropical top, top, topical topics, book clubs, and volunteer work phase. Um, the budget for the last year was thirty thousand, which we were we've stayed within. Um, the village. 
contribution helps us to subsidize participant costs for special events such as holiday dinners, lunches, and field trips to regional art museums, subsidize participant fees for extremely popular week weekly fitness classes, enhanced fitness, and matter of balance, fund various lectures, classes, and workshops offered to the community, and help with marketing and promotional expense. We could do none of this without the help of the foundation, too, by the way. They've been wonderful. Um, this year, we'd ask for an additional $4,000, which will cover our very successful pickleball program. And so if, if any of you have tried it, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. It is open to all ages, and uh, we're, we'd love to have it. But that's, that's it, right? So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ed. Okay, folks, this concludes your public comment. And now uh, we will uh, get started with our, our workshop portion. Mayor, if I may, and make yes. a recommendation for proceeding. Please. Um, I'd like to read into the record first the manager's memo that I place in your budget process. I also have a PowerPoint presentation which we'll go back over the year and review. And then we can turn this over to the department directors if you so desire. And I take it that's a yes. Yes. Yes, okay. So, Mayor, if I may, may I read the budget memo please, from the manager please. and the director? Thank you. <laughs> I am sorry about that. I thought you Good evening, Mayor and Council and, and, and residents. I'm a, I've attached to the budget document that you have in front of you a preliminary budget that will require additional changes by Council's direction and or the community's input. This budget workshop will provide an opportunity to begin deliberations in preparation for our two budget hearings on September 12th and 26th of 2017 as we move forward toward the finalization of the FY18 budget adoption. This budget workshop is designed to continue the efforts of this Village Council in completing previously approved capital improvement projects and to discuss future projects and funding sources. This budget workshop is also designed to hear from the public and those organizations that rely on financial assistance from the village as they provide enhanced and or additional programming to village residents. After hearing from the public on their thoughts and requests for FY18, department directors will present to council their proposed FY18 budget highlights as well as updating the village council on any significant issues with their current FY17 budgets. Department directors will also present their FYI, I'm sorry, FY18 capital improvement project recommendations. This budget workshop is not intended to be a discussion on proposed individual departmental line items. Department directors are available to meet with members of the village council and to set a convenient and agreed upon meeting date to have those detailed discussions prior to the September budget hearings. Village administration looks forward to the village council's feedback and guidance. Another goal of this village budget workshop, as in previous years, is to enhance services while still maintaining a cost-effective operational budget. On June 1st, the Miami-Dade County Property Appraiser's Office published the preliminary property values of the village of Key Biscayne. On July 1st, these, on July 1st, the final assessments will be provided to the village. With the preliminary property assessment, the village has experienced an increase in our property values of $296,715,123 or 5.6, I'm sorry, correction, 3.56%. 
And for comparison, last year, the village had an increase of 8.035%. Sustaining a 3.0 village millage rate would generate approximately an additional $2,236,714 in excess revenue over expenditures. The June 1st estimate provides a FYI 18 back rolled back rate of 2.8969, and that would generate approximately 1.390861 in excess over revenue expenditures. The state of Florida will be providing their projections for state shared revenues at the end of July and were not available at the time of creating this agenda for the budget workshop. Cost of living adjustments, or the COLA, for the proposed FY18 budget is based on the consumer price index for the urban consumers of the Florida, Miami slash Fort Lauderdale area. All items indexed, published by the Department of Labor Bureau and Labor Statistics for the 12th month change from April of 2016 to April of 2017, and is being reflected as a 2.8% COLA for eligible employees. Other assumptions included within this budget are Insurance, property, and liability premiums costs will remain the same for the proposed budget based upon the recommendation from our commercial insurance broker of Brown and Brown. Workers' compensation premium costs reflect an estimated 24.5% increase, once again based upon the recommendation from our commercial insurance broker. Life Health and disability insurance premiums reflect an estimated 10% increase based on the recommendation from our health insurance broker of record, which is National Marketing Group. Police officers, sergeants, and lieutenants are entitled to a COLA <clears throat> based on the CPI at 2.8%. Steps of 5% for eligible personnel, shift differentials of 3%, life, health, and disability insurance and pension retirement contributions reflect the existing labor contract obligations. In the fire department, the cost of living adjustment is once again on the CPI at 2.8%. Step in increases of 5% for eligible personnel. Life, health, disability insurance and pension retirement contributions reflecting existing labor contract obligations. Cost sharing for certain Public Works Division employee salaries is prorated for the, from the Stormwater Enterprise Fund and from the Building Zoning and Planning Department as in previous years. General employees are entitled to a cost of living adjustment based on the CPI of 2.8%, merit increase of up to 4% for eligible personnel <laughs> reflecting existing labor contract obligations. All exempt employees, a COLA based on the CPI of 2.8%, Step of 5% for eligible personnel and 25 year longevity step of 5% for eligible personnel. 18 village employees will reach their 25th year and uh, longevity this year in the upcoming FY18 budget. The village will continue negotiations with firefighters, police officers, and the general employees, thereby possibly changing the figures for the, from the first budget workshop to the first budget hearing on September 12th. Position reclassifications and additions within the department budgets, which may include additions to the table of organization or professional services, are as follows. Out of the manager's office, the addition of a full-time GIS specialist. Out of the building, zoning, and planning department, part-time mechanical inspector status changed to a full-time. And in the police department, the reclassification of a full-time senior municipal utility worker. Attached, please find the department budgets, including year-to-date expenditures on each summary sheet. The departmental summary sheets are divided into two areas, discretionary and non-discretionary line items. The non-discretionary line items represent personnel expenses inclusive of all benefits within collective bargaining agreements. Discretionary budget line items represent operational expenses under the direct control of the department directors. Department directors are about Department directors will be available at your request throughout the summer to discuss any questions you may have, any thoughts or concerns that you may have in an effort to make the budget hearings in September more efficient and effective. And Mayor, if I may spend about 10 minutes, I'd like to present a PowerPoint presentation to both the council and the community based on the year in review for what this council sure, has done. Please. 
Uh, okay. I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna get. I have Let's to get going. I, I, have to, I have to go put some ice on my my thing. But one of the and one of the special reasons that I came today was because I knew it was going to be Conchita's last last meeting. That's what definitely made me come, even though I was planning on coming at, at some point. And I just wanted to thank you for your 20 plus years of service here and, and tell you that very few people in this village are respected as much as you are. Thank you very much, Councilman. And uh, in the short period of time that I spent up here with you, you became a very good friend, and that'll always be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. First day of phase two, Conchita. Do you want to go down the ramp? <laughs> All right, Mayor, Mayor, Council, and, and the public, I'd like to start off with the accomplishments that this council was able to fulfill during this uh, budget year. We start off with the community center ex second floor vertical expansion. We moved to the community center's floor and wall padding replacement. We've appreciated the grand opening of the community center's corner cafe. We've made playground improvements. We've started the Lime bike sharing program. We are near completion, but significantly so with the 401 Hampton Park. With a name? Freebie through a public philanthropic partnership is now with the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. And as Melissa pointed out, this is a this is an enhancement to the program that I presented to you last year. The police departments conducted their zero tolerance traffic campaign. We did quarterly environmental cleanups through diving. We introduced the virtual driver interactive system at the Mast Academy. For the second year in a row, a row, I'm sorry, a very and extremely successful drug awareness program, and by that I don't mean more drugs being used, I mean more people being educated on the hazards and the, the tremendous amount of um, challenges that the, that the drugs in this community represent right now, and I am very, very proud of both the police department and fire department for carrying this through for another year. The boys with toys, the fire chief purchased a brand new Key Biscayne Quint. We're still one step ahead of the police department. John, don't start. There. I won't. I'm sorry. I take it back. I'll finish. Yeah. <laughs> You've got motorcycles last year. We've, uh, we've enhanced our firefighter survival training, especially in high rises. And I think it's never been more important than it has been over the last couple of weeks when we've seen some of the horrific fires that have occurred around the country and around the world. We've updated our EMS reporting hardware, quicker response, quicker information to the hospital, and more complete reports. We've updated our floodplain ordinance. In the community center, once again, we've enhanced the, our AV installation to make that room and make that process almost like it is here in the council chambers. And the community center's network for infrastructure installation has been completed. In progress, but still under the auspices of this council CIP and this council's approval, we have the 530 Crandon Boulevard Park design now entering the construction bid process. We've upgraded the community center software. We will be updating the community center's camera system. This was approved at the last couple of council meetings. The community center indoor playground replacement is well on the way. Again, through Council's action, the Village Green Irrigation Replacement in all areas other than the two fields that will be, uh, that will have a different finish to them. I'm being careful here. That was very euphemistic. I, I, the Village Green Field Surface Replacement. 
the second community center expansion phase to planning. This would be uh, discussions that council has had regarding enlarging the, the community center and possibly by moving it toward the north and looking at the area where the pool is and things of that nature. We're in the process, and you'll hear a little, about, a little more about it in a few minutes, the implementation of our new building permit system. We are conducting an independent study to review building permit process and fees. <coughs> Excuse me. And lastly, I want to show some of the village's supported initiatives, and that is the subsidized programs that were brought to you by the community a few minutes ago. Um, its total is approximately four hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of our taxpayers' money going to support these kinds of enhancements. That, as you saw, a lot of people need a lot of financial help and assistance to make these programs successful once again. And to a presentation, you'll find that the manager fully recommends those. So, any questions on the presentation up to this point? No, other than thank you, you've done a tremendous amount. No, this is the this is the community thanking the council with foresight, with, with understanding of what our needs are, and with the, with the understanding that given the direction we can make things happen, this is another good year for the village. You're here. So if I may, what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin going through the, hopefully everyone has their budget book. <clears throat> On the first page after the man manager's memo, you just see a summary. These numbers are at about the 98, 98.5% mark. Um, we still are con uh, having contract negotiations with all five unions. Um, there is some fundings that, uh, from revenues that have still not hit our coffers yet. But at this point in time, if we were to remain, a three, remain with a 3.0 millage rate, this budget reflects a 4% increase across the board. We'll break it down by departments, but overall your summary sheet shows an increase of about 4%. You have, that was slipped into your council, in, uh, the next page should read what you have in front of you called general fund revenues. This is at about the 98% of, just yes sir? Preview sheet, 3% increase in revenues, 4% increase in expenditures, right? Yes sir. Okay. The um, general fund revenue sheet you've just seen for the first time this evening. Uh, I'll be more than uh, happy to sit down with each of you regarding this sheet, but this is where the proposed revenues are coming from and approximately how much money we can expect to, to receive from them. Again, at about the 98% mark. If I start with the departments, we'll start with the village council. Your, your budget appears in the budget book at a, about a 19% decrease in budget from over all last year. Uh, that remains entirely with the um, sunsetting of Schwartz Media. Mm -hmm. And everything else in your budget remains the same. Quick question, and I guess we'll hear from Art in Public Places, but there seems the programming seems to have there, tapered off a little bit. There was, and I think that Sergio or someone from, we have been in touch, and I also think that we're getting ready to yeah, amp it back up. Though, but, yeah, right, yes, ma'am. I, I can, I don't know whether it's, it's not timely now, but we had a couple of meetings right. this week, and I'm aware of what's projected, and if there's an appropriate time to share that information, we can, we can do that. Fair enough, and I think we had requested um, our grantees to give us reports before we were, to, so so that is all due, it's part, gonna be part of this budget process. We'll have those to you, the, 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 the next cycle is at the end of July, July 31st, Perfect. so they'll be part Thank of your you. August, okay. Um, let's see, the next one of the manager's office. Um, my overall budget's down 5%. We can get into um, the professional services is showing a figure of a proposal of 15,000. I'm sorry, is that the right number? Yeah. That's a typo that should read 65,000. And these are the professional services that I can break down once again with each council member. And it goes back to the auditors, the, the, the assessors, the things that we use on a routine basis. We had 200,000 set aside because we were trying to do more in the different departments we stopped doing it once we went into the process of evaluating both fee structure and fee process in building zoning and planning. Mm -hmm. But when I proposed this budget last year and that figure, we did not have this in play. 
Did you say it was 65,000? Yeah, the number is showing is 15, but it should be 65,000. And will that affect your 5% decrease? Yes, then? yes. We'll get the uh, more accurate numbers to you before the end of August. And in due, with due respect, and this being her last budget, her last council meeting, I will turn over the clerk's budget to be presented by the outgoing clerk. Can you, can you speak about the GIS specialist? Yes, we have currently a, a part-time employee subcontracted through Jose Lopez that does our GIS. We are moving that position over into my office and we're moving it as a full-time position. Is there a reason why it's in your, in your budget? I like GIS under me. Okay. Uh, IT and GIS, they're, they're, they're kind of the technical part of things, and what we're trying to do out here, I'm very comfortable with keeping that in the manager's office. Okay. Conchita? Okay, in the clerk's office, um, we're going to change uh, the proposed clerk's salary mm -hmm. to what was approved tonight, $108,759. Uh, $108, and... Um, I don't know. We have some election expenses, um, five thousand for advertising and five thousand for election expense. And the reason for those uh, being in this fiscal year is in case we have a mayoral primary election, because the mayoral primary election falls in August. So, yeah. So that's why I have. Uh, set aside, you know, those in case we have a mayoral primary. I don't know if you have any other questions about my budget. Not, not this August, a year from now. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, because this budget is yeah. for next year. Great. Thank you for the clarification, Vice Mayor. I, I saw Council Member Petros. I know. Sweat, so. <laughs> <laughs> <My advice. laughs> All right, following the clerk's um, Thank you, Mr. Manager. Yes, ma'am. We have the attorney's budget. If there's any questions, it remains the same. Are we still going to have um, the litigation, 750000 Do we still need that full amount? I mean, I guess something, something to think about. You know, it, it we'll, we'll know more in August, yeah. uh, but I hope this number is going to change materially. Okay. But I think for now we need to keep it right. where as it is because it's... Right. Uncertain. Right. It's uncertain. <coughs> Year to date, we're at 101, so we're on target for 200 to 250 right now, right? I don't know what will happen. But. Our fiscal year ends July. Oh yeah, sorry. Right. So no, we're October. We're, no, September. It September. ends September. So we're more than. We're more I'm, than, I'm thinking. Yeah, so we're even lower. We're yeah, we, 150. Lower. We're going to be at. Yep. Like Depending on what happens, if we go into some type of litigation. And we will clearly have a much better idea. We, we will. Okay. Uh, I mean, we should just, it, I think it's going to be more positive than it was last year. We'll see. Okay. I don't think there's any questions, but I'm ready to answer on the debt service. Just one quick question. Was the recent loan modification we did on the school bond reflected? Yes. Perfect. Good. I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at the number. I'm, I'm, she's, yes. Okay. And I was going across the wrong way. Uh, yes. Quick question. And I noticed this through a couple of the uh, different departments. And it's not a lot of money, but I just wanted to understand this. I, I see a big increase happening in um, workers' compensation and the the liability insurance. Is there a reason why they're, they're having big jumps? Yes. The, and, I, and they will be here in, Oct in August or in early September. But different groupings of employees have different rates mm -hmm. assigned to them. Yep. Police and fire have different rates than general employees, or inspectors have a different rate. than. So that's figured into the formula. And that's why, and, and Bob Hollander, for those of you that have been on council before, he's very, very knowledgeable in that. But it is basically, and as far as property goes, uh, we have to continuously update the property uh, inventory that we have to the insurance company, and the insurance company only makes one adjustment a year, and that's at the end of the year. 
groups, but the variances are ranging from 30 to 40 percent on many from last year to this year's. Any, I mean, we can wait until September to talk to the no, experts. No. But is there a reason why those jumps from one year to the next year? I'll give you, I'll give you Mr. Hollander's phone number. I mean, he's got it. But yeah, be but in answer to the question, um, yeah. I, I see what your what your concern is with those kinds of numbers, but again, it's based on a formula that we have no. Well, that's not fair. Let me go there. It's based on a formula number one where there's rating differentials. Also, under workers' comp, we have a, uh, a, a significant bump because of the experience that he has had over the last two years, and he was able to explain that without violating certain things. The, the property insurance, once again, we just bought a $900,000 fire truck. It's going to affect our rates. Uh, we're putting on new buildings. We added the expansion. That's a new footage, a new square footage. That'll have a new rate. Uh, but we'll have more definitive numbers for you in August. Can I ask a quick question of how workers' comp is calculated? Is it calculated <laughs> for in village employees as a whole, and then you give a proportion to each of the de these departments, or is each department treated as a separate entity when you're looking? Not when it comes to insurance. Those those working groups, and again, fire, police, general employees, They're inspectors, that's, he calculates those into the workers' comp number. We do prorate equally across the board for non-personnel items, electricity, water, things of that nature. But the person Personnel items are based on their their job classification, for lack of a better word. And the high risk and what have you. Whatever and and the claims. And the claims. And the claim. Well, yeah. yes, and I didn't know if claims in one department were impacting rates in another because it was one big umbrella as opposed to a bunch of separate columns. Well, ultimately, the claims will. Yeah. It does affect. It does. Right. The claims will, right. Across the whole, okay. when when okay. when when we've got a two hundred thousand dollar claim, it affects our insurance premium. At no, I understand that, but does no. it? I'm sorry. I guess I'm not being clear. If we have a two hundred thousand dollar claim, let's say because of something that occurred in the police department, is that impacting workers' comp rates? Yes, ma'am. In the community center, yes, employees. Okay. Overall, for okay. the premium adjustment, it's based on what the employee does. Okay. The payout and the, and the experience goes generally over all the entire process. Okay. All right, I'm going to um, next bring up building zoning and planning. I, I think what we should do is uh, Sergio is going to introduce JRD. JRD was doing the uh, assessment study for our permit fees. Um, they have made a presentation to uh, both Sergio and I. We promised this during the budget, I mean, during the hiring of them. So I'll turn it over to Sergio. Director, um, we hired JRD consultants to take a look at our permit fees overall. Tonight's presentation, he's going to he's going to present on the effects of having lowered the permit fees temporarily since February of this year to uh, year to date. Um, that is in the hopes of bringing some of that reserve money down. Um, we need to be cautious about how much we bring that reserve down because uh, we are moving towards a technology department. And that's what the reserves are useful for, is to be able to purchase those technologies for electronic plan reviews for mobile computing for field inspectors. Um, and, uh, and that will be used from the reserve as well. Um, state statute allows a building department to have reserves and to be able to manage through years um, and keep, a, a, and keep a somewhat of a reserve to avoid um, uh, interruption in service. So, but tonight's presentation, uh, JRD, uh, George Fraga will talk to you about the uh, temporary effects of those lowered permit fees. And as we move forward into a full permit study uh, later on uh, this summer. George? Okay. I think I lost. It should it's just back. cycling through. It's, it'll switch back. Okay. Surely it'll stop. All right. Hello, I'm George Fraga with JRD and Associates. Good evening. And kind of to give you an overview of, of our contract, we were contracted by the village uh, to conduct an, uh, an assessment 
of the village's permit fees for building, zoning, planning, public works, and fire prevention. Kind of the, con the contract, it has two overall scopes. First scope is to assess the financial impact of the amended building permit fee that was changed in February. And the second overall scope is the, to conduct a permit fee analysis. Um, that one includes a recommended permit fee schedule, a strategy for decreasing existing and future building permit surpluses, and also to do a, comp a comparative analysis of specified permit fees with, you know, with comparable municipality in Miami-Dade County. That fee analysis results in findings and recommendations will present at the first village budget hearing in September. Uh, for today's presentation, we're presenting uh, the financial impact, as Sergio mentioned, of the amended permit, uh, building renovation permit fee. <coughs> so back in February 2021, 20, uh, um, the village amended the, the renovation permit fee, just the building permit fee, not the, the electrical, uh, plumbing, and mechanical permits. Okay. So to kind of give you a single family resident, the residential renovation fee was 7%. Uh, for construction value. After February 22nd, it became 70 cents a square foot. So to kind of give you an example, the remodeling of a kitchen or bathroom for 300 square feet, $20,000, was $1,400 in building permit fees prior to the, uh, the amendment. Now it will cost $210, a reduction of $1,190. For commercial uh, renovation fees, it was at 1.8% of the value of construction. It got changed about 44% less to 1% of the cost, not to exceed $10,000, and, and a minimum fee of $250. I also forgot to mention the residential fee has a minimum of $100. So let's give an example of the commercial reservation, uh, uh, renovation. 1,000 square foot, $32,000 worth of value. And the pr prior permit would have cost $576. The new amended fee, about $320, a reduction of $256. So we analyzed uh, from the moment of February 22nd to uh, May 31st. During that time period, there was 95 building renovation permits that were applied for. Uh, the majority of them, 86 permits, were about 91% were residential. Uh, during that time, 85% of the applications had their permits issued, about 13% had their permits closed and final. Kind of wanted to give you kind of the scope of what we looked at. So based on revenue, the village uh, generated 78% less revenue than they would have with the previous permit fee. So kind of in the total, I showed it here between commercial and residential, it's a total revenue where the old fee would have been around just over $316,000 with the new fee, it's actually just about $69,500. So what does that mean? Uh, based on our projections for FY 2007, we anticipate a 64% decrease in the revenue generated from renovation permits. Remember, this is, again, once just a building, not mechanical, like performance. There's also a slight uh, decrease in the permit volume for renovation permits, about an 11% decrease that, that's projected. And to kind of take a look at it from the time period in FY17, the average permit price went from 2000 for residential $2,706 down to the average of $548 after the permit renovation. For commercial, it went down just a little bit less, just under $2,700 to just under $2,500. Our projections for the building division and just the building division uh, is based on the amended renovation fees and totally all the permit revenue, we anticipate, uh, we project there'll be just under 360, we'll be operating under just under $363,000 under the budgeted FY 2017 expenditures. So what's the next steps, okay? Um, from our perspective, uh, on, on August 29th, we'll deliver the draft report for the permit fee analysis. Well, that'll include the, the recommended permit fee schedule. We're big on simplifying permit fee schedules. Well, that'll include consolidation, consolidation of, of fees, addition of fees, maybe deletion of fees uh, to the existing fee schedule. Uh, we're gonna base those fees based on cost recovery for the 
the actual cost of providing those permit related services. That includes also the support or the indirect cost that the building department gets from other departments. Um, we'll also project what the, you know, what the future revenue will be based on the proper, uh, proposed fee schedule, kind of a reality check to make sure. Um, we'll also develop a strategy for decreasing existing and building permit surpluses, like I mentioned before. We're conducting the comparative analysis. We will also be uh, presenting that proposed fee schedule at some, at some point in time uh, to the construction industry at a dedicated industry meeting. And then finally, the findings and recommendations of the permit fee schedule, or the permit fee analysis will be presented at the first village budget hearing. Any questions? In, in your report, you know, one, one thing I'm, I'm interested in is, is the cost of providing permit-related services. It's a concept question. It's, it's a math question, but it's also a concept question. And in your report, I would appreciate it, and I think that we would all appreciate it, if you would speak to the concept. It, why some things are just paid for out of general revenue as part of the overall department budget, and why other things have a, have a cost additive associated with the provision of a particular type of service. Okay, in the report, okay. Okay? You understand what I mean? Yeah, no, no. I, I have a question, maybe it's more for the manager than for you, but I'm trying to correlate your findings with um, our year to date on our building permit fees. And it looks like it's in the general fund revenue page that we got. Number three two two. Yeah, three two two. Because that number is much higher than the number you're reporting, and I'm just trying to understand the difference. And then I also wanted to know if we're actually paying for that out of reserve. Is this from our? This one looks different. We got it tonight. Yeah, that's an addition. All permits. What is that? It says building permits. Is that? Include other things oh, on our. Wait, I'm sorry. Which which number are you looking at? Three two two. Three two two on the sheet that he just handed you. Three two two, and you're comparing it to which? Your three hundred. I think you you said that we would be three hundred and sixty three thousand okay. below Less than the budget last year's. So that so remember, we're looking at only renovation permit revenue. Yep. Not right. Including the revenue from, exactly. so that building yeah. permit revenue. Includes all and permits. Electrical plumbing. Okay. And I'm also including in the revenue um, violations as well. Uh, so That's that, down here under fines that be, though, that looks separate. All the building division revenue that goes into them. So, uh, as well. Is that is that item, John, license and permits? Under our revenues here for a projected 1.66 million business permits and business licenses. I don't know. I, I was wondering, does that include building permits in there? Because I'm trying to find out where that comes in our revenue sheet in our packet that we have. Sergio has it. So the re the revenue is on your front sheet for revenue is adding the license and permits is actually adding the. Um, uh, BTRs plus the anticipated revenue from building permits. Okay. That brings up the 1.6. It's all bundled in one. Yes. Business tax revenue and yes. the, yeah, business tax and. Business tax and, and the uh, permit fees. Okay, so we're, we're, we're actually going to be more than what we thought we were going to be last year, even with this, with this uh, change in our permit fee schedule. Well, it's lower than previous years. The pre if you go back to 2016, you saw that you saw that uh, license and revenues were 2.5, almost 2.5. So we're projecting, and this is the projection based on uh, a future revised permit fees, okay. which are not which are not as low as this temporary measure, right? Mm -hmm. But as not as high as we previously had either. So, in, in 2017, we adopted 1.635, or no? Is that an error? I'm looking it at looks like we, we that was yeah. that's, that's the adopted. That's what we adopted. And then we're proposing 1.66 for next so, year. Or is that not taking into consideration all of this stuff that's going on right now? It's 
It's probably just a, it's just a projection. We don't know the effects of what the revised, the permanently revised mm -hmm. permit fees will have. We'll have to wait another year to see what that looks like, and and then be able to make a projection on that. We kept it level. With, level with the projection with, with, for this year. For the current year. So, we're, but we're anticipating that it's going to be at l probably three hundred and fifty thousand dollars lower. We in that line item we've only got what's this three months worth of history yeah. here right mm -hmm. we're yeah. gonna you know we knew that we were going to be giving you a draft report in june you've got what you've got it doesn't it doesn't equate out because we don't have enough history but what you will have for the budget hearing will be six months worth of data and our projection our professional uh, projections will be part of that change in these numbers and change in what the proposed 2018 budget is going to look like yeah because the, the only thing that i'm thinking is that most likely that it won't we won't hit this and and from what we did in the change of the permit fees we're we're going to have to take out a general funds to to make up for that and when they do that uh, our three percent and four percent it changes quite a bit very quickly so just you know keep it in mind that well the surplus really we would use the well, surplus yeah. and not the general funds oh we're well, not that's true we the the general, okay. we're not going right, to use fine. general funds right. we can't for this year, or, we shouldn't Okay. No, it, it shouldn't. Right. there's going to be no need to, yeah, and you'll have a full forgot, explanation. Forgot about the surplus. About the surplus. Full explanation. <laughs> and that's where we'll test drive the new permit fees in another see year. How it works. Yes. And see how that Before works. Before we have to start taking out of general funds. Yeah. We will never take it out of we'll be So how do you control. propose to handle budgeting for the upcoming year, it's neutral. given all these factors that are, are moving? Very delicately. <laughs> I mean, these are all projections. It's very difficult to say what the market will do next year as far as activity. You know how the market comes. Right, but we're going to know, a, a, we're going to theoretically adopt a new fee schedule that's different than the one we're currently using. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and in addition, we should have at that time an understanding of what the actual costs are that are associated with those permit fees to attempt to get a balance, correct? And we can comparatively, comparatively make uh, look at previous fees to proposed fees and give you a comparative permit to permit basis. But remember that it all depends on what kind of permits are issued throughout the year. The mix could vary greatly from one year to another. Yeah, I just think for our residents, given the discussion that we had when this all came up, it's going to be really important to show some form of a cost structure and then the fee structure and how those two relate. Right. And I think I think you saw some of that for this stopgap, where we compared um, JRD compared a residential permit and a commercial permit. We'll do the same. We'll take various types of permits, and we'll we'll show you what the old permit fee would have looked like, and we'll show you what the new one. I think there's a, another part of this though, because I get what you're saying, and you're showing us the old and the new, but we're still not seeing the cost. The overall the cost of administering that permit, which is the, the key item here, yeah, because we need to try to, to match that to Correct. to our charges. Uh -huh. And that's that's what we need to show to the residents that we've we've done that in an attempt to get as budget neutral as process as possible in this process. Just just to remind just to remind everyone, and I think we do up here remember this the primary reason we did this adjustment when we did it is to correct a tremendous inequity, which was basically a result that caused someone that was doing a $50,000 remodeling job to pay the same exact cost as somebody that was building a 5,000 square foot new house. And that was absolutely absurd. So we may have not allocated our adjustment properly, but we don't want to get back into a situation where we're in effect discriminating against one form of construction as opposed to another. It's got to be fair across the board. And it has to be consistent with the statute that we exactly. read. That's exactly. really the most important part. Which of is that the fees would cover the cost of the Correct. operation. Yeah. Right. And that, that is that is the goal. And yes. yeah, and one of the things then the recommended fee, and that's that's where the second bullet under the recommended we're, we're basing off the recovery of the actual cost. So we kind of we're looking at each permit fee, looking at and the tr tricky part is also the indirect fee because you gotta understand what the indirect fee is. Or a percentage of of certain of components of your department. But I think as long as we can show due diligence on that, that's the important part. And now you all you, you will have this report for us for August twenty ninth. 
Yeah, that's great. That's and I think there's a second component, I don't know if it's the same deadline or later, but kind of evaluating efficiencies within the department. That is, the process is part of the scope. Just a fee we had that covered under me. Okay. That's, that's taken care of, and it has been discussed, and it is part of the process, the report that you will get. We were still focused on the fee structure, but you will have a process Excellent. of how that permit goes from here to there to and the time and the, the time and motion study, for lack of a better word, old school, just exactly what it's costing to do that permit. Thank you. Okay. One other quick question. Can we have at that time an understanding of how much of the surplus we've needed to use in order to make ends meet? For... Uh, that's going to be part of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. We've got two things going yes. at the same time. Okay. Yes, ma'am. John, the... Yes, ma the evaluation of the process that's being done in-house? It will be done. We have spoken to JRD about this, and it will be done by, they're most familiar. They've, they've spent almost, what, 90 days actually living in, in the department. They know exactly what we need to do, and what we need to do is cost that out for, like, Donald Ellsberg and, like, the, the councilwoman says, what is it costing me to get this permit? Not what I'm paying for the permit, but what is it costing me to do this permit? You, you know, there's one other thing we might want to do, because... The, the, the result that we tried to correct was years and years of the building and zoning director understanding that we expected him to make a profit. And he was operating the department as if it was a profit center. I think we need to decide um, what we want this department to be. Do we want it to be a completely break-even department so that these fees cover all the costs of operation? Or do we want parts of it to be subsidized by our ad valorem taxes and not strictly a user fee? And I think we have to kind of make that decision to give some direction as to what kind of fee structure we end up with. Um, and that should come from up here, I believe, as opposed to someplace else. And I don't think that we've actually gotten to that point yet. I do think, you know, in the in the five and a half years I've been sitting this day as there's never been a communication that this department was to run a profit. So I, I think that's um, a misconception. I think and, it was and, a misunderstanding. I, and, and I want to be clear about that. That just was never the policy of that I recall from any of my council members in the last five and a half I years. I think that, that mindset, that policy, if you want to call it that, okay. came from years um, prior to you being involved on the council or anyone that's here now, it's just something that evolved from some place that nobody can identify. And we put a stop to it, but we now meet, I believe we need to, to really set the direction as to how much of this department's operating costs do we really want to cover from the fees that are being charged. And I'm not sure we want to cover the entire thing. Well, my understanding is it's based on statute. It has to be budget neutral. Yeah, the, let me just Parts kinda- of, but not the whole thing. Let me just read into to this, what the statute says. Um, <clears throat> the statute says, when providing a, a schedule of reasonable fees, the total estimated annual revenue derived from the fees and the fines and investment earnings related to the fees may not exceed the total estimated annual costs of allowable activities. So it's meant to be a cost neutral. However, the statute does go on to say it acknowledges that there will be times when you have a surplus, and it does go on to say how you can spend that, that surplus. Well, it's an interesting question because clearly from what the reading of the statute shows, the department these fees are not supposed to generate a profit, yeah. but it doesn't mandate that the department can't operate at a loss from its own internal fees and get subsidized through other sources. There's no doubt that, I mean, the department could be subsidized by the general fund. Uh, I think that the theory uh, behind it is, is that the building department should be funded by the yes. applicants using the service, and if it's being funded by the taxpayers, then it's the taxpayers that are subsidizing the department. Um, I think that's, that's why typically these fees are created to be cost neutral to try to run on its own without being subsidized by the general revenue fund. Correct. But not every expense it, under the building, zoning, and planning department 
Oh, wow, that's be attributed directly to someone using a permit or paying a permit. Correct. Not every expense is. It's not allowed to be. Exactly. Only, only the well, building. It's only in, right. Exactly. To, to kind of weed out what what should be considered the cost component of the building permits, so that we can establish a cost neutral side to that component of our BZ department. And that's hopefully what we'll end up with. Yeah. Hopefully. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Together with the rationale of those types of <laughs> services that really do correlate with with um, <coughs> fee functions, fee paid functions, as opposed to general. Yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you. Good. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in about a month back in April. Is there anything else in your budget? Did you have? Did anyone else have a question on this budget? Well, can, can you mention about going from part-time to full-time mechanical inspector? Yes. You guys made that change, right? Yes. So curr currently we have a part-time uh, mechanical inspector. Um, so we lack uh, services in that uh, one discipline where all the other dis disciplines are full-time <laughs> dedicated employees. Uh, we're unable to provide services on a Friday and the hours during the week Monday through Thursday is very limited. Um, so we're moving forward with a full-time chief mechanical so that we can provide full service in that respect, equal to the other trades as well. And your capital outlay, is that for the software that we're that's in? That's for the technology we're looking at, we're looking for next year, yes. That's the computers the uh, and the field uh, equipment for the inspectors. And, and sir, so just to be clear, because I, I think there were some issues before, um, the new full-time position they will be expected to be here because I understand that with some of our part timers, they were part timing in different communities, and so it was hard. Is that to address that issue that they are expected to physically be here? Correct. Thank you very much. That'll be held. Also, our full time employees do they work a th what? How many hours a week do they work? Uh, seven, just like everybody else. Their shift is seven to seven to two thirty, I believe it is. So they're in the office till about uh, ten thirty or so. Uh, processing plans, walk through permitting, they'll go out and they'll do their inspection. So it's a 35 hour work week? 35 hour work week. Okay. Thank is you. that true across the board or is that, I mean, in all, all our employees, it's a 35 hour work week? Yes. With the exception of, I think, in fire, I think that their inspector was a 40 hour inspector. Everybody else is 37, 37 and a half hours. Okay. Sergio, what was the big change in operating supplies? He's saying up from four thousand to fifty-five thousand. Oh, that's mm -hmm. the annual software license. Okay. That we're going to start paying next year. That's forty-one thousand dollars extra. Yes. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There's a lesson, Mayor, in calling something what it is in the budget line items. Indeed. And the percentage. Do you, um, I ask this question every time. Do you have enough enforcement staff support capability to adequately enforce our code? Our codes, plural. Building code or zoning? Zoning, code? building. Building? Zoning, Everything. including zoning. Including zoning. Activity right now, I mean, I've been, I've been here for almost four weeks now, so getting my hands around the operations part of it. Um, I know that cyclically work goes up and down. I think this year we're a little bit lower than we were last year. I know that the guys work hard in the, in the office to get plans out and they struggle to finish up the inspections. Um, it is one person per trade, basically. So if work goes up, I'm sure that our building official has a contingency plan of calling in a, a part-time person, should that be mm -hmm. the need. Um, but it all varies according to the activity uh, that we see uh, every year. Uh, code enforcement, um, we're two members. Um, it all depends on how active we want to be. I know that we want to do some more educational programs this year and be proactive instead of reactive, as in previous years. Uh, but again, I'm getting a feel for that and don't have a recommendation for you at this point. Let's talk before August. Okay. I support the educational part. It's necessary. 
We don't want to be in the enforcement business. Right. We want to help people understand. Right. Well, but we also want people to think that we are here as government to address problems as they arise and that there is a, a, a mechanism for that. Yeah, and I think the specific, your answer reveals a lot because the question, you're, you're embedded in your answer is how how much we want to do with this. And, and the year by year by year reason I ask the question is is because there's a perception that we don't do enough. Mm -hmm. Agreed. We'll talk. Next. Next budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief. If I may, with the police department's budget. They're showing a 4% increase in their budget overall from last year. Good evening, Mayor. Good Council. evening. Just a, a couple of highlights I think I would like to put out there ahead of everything else. Um, if you notice in our personnel section, you notice uh, one less police officer and you notice uh, one additional sergeant. Uh, that was fulfilling the promise that I made to create a separate traffic unit uh, so that we can provide better traffic enforcement throughout the village. So although we reduced the number of police officers by one, and we increased the supervisor position by one, I am extremely confident that our sergeant who oversees the traffic unit, uh, Sergeant Kemmerer, uh, who literally produces as much as the rest of his team, uh, and acts as a not only a supervisor, but also a street cop at the same time, uh, we're able to provide a, a much better performance out there in our long-term goal of reducing the majority of our traffic violations here on Key Biscayne. I also introduced uh, a position, uh, and we are looking at two things. Number one, approval from council tonight. Uh, and number two, once I get that approval, going to uh, the state to get the position approved through, through the union, through PERC. But it's, it's, it's now called a fleet services coordinator, and that used to be the position of senior municipal utility worker. And in essence, we took a look at uh, the entire fleet in the village and the fact that each department uh, at times used different entities to provide maintenance, to manage their vehicles, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, in discussions with the manager, thought that the best way to maintain our fleet, uh, similar to how we've been able to do it on the police department, is to have a long-term management system in place and use somebody to oversee that. So we've taken her duties and responsibilities as a senior municipal utility worker, and I would uh, show you that uh, I have no patience to open these <laughs> things. I would show you that when you take a look at all of the responsibilities that she currently has, and then you would add the additional responsibilities to be our fleet services coordinator. I took a look. I did some comps throughout Miami-Dade County. Uh, we picked out a salary that was a little more than 6% more than she makes right now, uh, much less than the fleet management coordinators in every other municipality that we looked at. Um, so we kept her salary fair, yet added a tremendous amount of responsibility. And when you think about the fact that the village uh, invests quite a bit of money in their fleet, uh, and you take a look at the police department alone, and Nerva Jean has managed that fleet to the point of we've been able to get seven, eight, nine years out of emergency vehicles, which is almost unheard of. She has single-handedly uh, watched over these cars as if they're her own. The only thing she would not be dealing with, of course, is those big, pretty fire trucks that those fire guys <laughs> have. Um, and they have the city of Miami that handles that. But all of their uh, administrative vehicles and every other vehicle in the village will be handled by her. Mm -hmm. I think it's a move that's uh, positive for the government. Uh, I think it's necessary. 
uh, for our capital investment uh, to provide you the best bang for your buck at very little investment by the village of Key Biscayne. Is, is that, that's line 12.6, right? Pardon? That's yes. uh, the $6,000 increase. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And the next discussion I want to have with you all is our dispatchers. Our starting salary for our dispatchers has been the same since we started our communications many years ago, with the exception of some colas that have gone in and things of that nature, longevity. Our starting salary was $30,000 and change. That's almost comical. They were making less money than our school crossing guards were making and doing a job with tremendous responsibilities and a workload, since they work in there by themselves, that is uh, just more abundant than what they should be charged with. So I did five comps throughout Miami-Dade County. I looked at Miami Beach, Sunny Isles, Miami Gardens, Pine Crest, and Doral. And again, ensuring that the village of Key Biscayne was not uh, looking to be the top of the line, top of the world, but at the same time, trying to come up with a medium. Uh, we did an average of those comps and came up with a new salary range. Um, which is, again, not earth-shattering, but it brings them more in line with uh, their job specifications. They're, they're uh, now required to carry and maintain certifications that they weren't before, um, and, and I felt it was necessary. This um, was not something that uh, they came to me and asked for. This was something that, as a chief of police, I felt it was incumbent upon me to uh, ensure that we had provided the, the, the best opportunity for these people should they want to be long-term, and our people are long-term. How many, how many dispatchers do we have? We have four dispatchers and one supervisor. Each dispatcher works on a squad. So we have our four squads. Our supervisor not only... Uh, manages the department, but she does other jobs equally as well throughout the department when we run short of uh, some of our administrative personnel. So she is also a multitasker. And with that, I'm going to leave it up to you all to uh, start asking questions. Sure. Um, Chief, over time, we have for years historically been trying to keep and work on the overtime we um, and it seems to be crawling. Excuse me. I haven't thought about that. And it seems to be crawling up. And in fact, last year we added positions in an effort to address overtime. We added three positions. So I'm a little baffled as to why we are increasing the overtime. Okay, I will explain to you. This is several of the adjustments we made. Our biggest adjustment comes in training. And I will give you to the tune of how much we have addressed that training with overtime. Now, keep in mind that all of our training has to be done when we're off duty. We don't have the manpower to train when we're on duty. We are at minimum staffing every day. So, for instance, today was our training, our mandatory training for non-lethal weapons that we carry, i.e., uh, the spray, uh, the ASP baton, CPR, and the AED training. So we took the entire staff that was scheduled to work today, day shift and night shift, and we had to make their day today a training day, and we had to backfill all 10 of those positions with overtime. Now, we do firearms training twice a year. We have our rapid response training to the tune of $13,000 for quarterly training. We have incorporated the active killer training for the entire organization to the tune of $29,000 because that training requires twice a year. 
Um, we have added honor guard training, our tabletop scenario training, <clears throat> our yearly qualifying for our firearms, which is uh, once a year. And we have also uh, increased slightly our in-kind services, which we provide to a multitude of different events that occur on the key, whether they are sponsored by Key Biscayne or whether they are sponsored by outside entities. How much is that in kind? Right now, we are looking at $14,000 increase based on all of the What's events the that we do. And bear with me, I can tell you if you'll give me a second. Me Art Festival, Miami Open, Christmas in July, the uh, Silent Bike uh, Bicycle Ride, Boat Parade, Winterfest, Lighthouse Run, Movies and Concerts on the Green. Um, we have participated in the Junior Orange Bowl Parade, the Key Biscayne Home Tours, charity events, and crime prevention. All of those are considered in-kind services that we provide and we can only provide with overtime personnel. We also have uh, leave that we still have to, and that takes up the majority of our overtime, regardless of the fact that we hired two more personnel. Those people were hired to be part of the traffic unit. We still maintain minimum staffing on our squads. So if, if somebody takes a comp day off, a sick day off, a vacation day off, uh, we backfill with a shift. So our year to date is two hundred and thirty-seven thousand four hundred and thirty-two. Yes, we are asking to propose. I, I really, again, based on the history of this budgeting, am very concerned. We've added positions. I think it would be natural to have some relief on the overtime. That's ma'am, exactly and 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 I understand your concern, and I could tell you that you are about to see quite a lot more of that year-to-date number go up. That number is not accurate because we have quite a bit of uh, training scheduled in the future uh, before October 1st. That is our mandated training that we have every year. So you're going to see that line item closer to the actual number that was proposed in 2016-17. Uh, and I can also tell you that um, Deputy Chief Eunice has worked diligently with his staff to uh, try and, I don't want to use the word manipulate, but try and work around uh, leave requests so that we can fill them in some other ways, some creative ways with with other folks, like on Marine Patrol, where we could use an auxiliary person if a Marine Patrol person takes a day off, uh, and, and things of that nature, so we could plug and play and avoid some overtime. So I, I have to give him and his staff the credit. I know you don't like overtime. I don't like overtime. But as they say in government accounting, um, I could surely add another person to each squad and reduce my leave overtime by 50, 60 percent because I won't be violating uh, the, the safety minimum standards uh, that, that we maintain on this department. I, um, I but that cost equates to salaries and benefits. Mm -hmm. And for all the years I've been in government, uh, the standard has been work them. And, and it's cheaper to pay overtime than it is to pay salaries and bennies. Is it cheaper? And and for example, if we were to hire one full-time police officer, would the cost of that police officer with salary and benefits be less than the overtime that we're incurring as a result of being at minimal staffing? And can you do that type of analysis so that we can look at minimizing costs. I, I, I will absolutely do the analysis for you, but I can tell you that hiring one person takes care of one squad. We have four squads and we have minimum staffing on those squads. So it would take four people theoretically. So would, in essence, in reality, and I'll, I'll do the study for you and, and, and we'll quantify what, what we're discussing here. But when you talk about hiring a cop with salary and benefits, a starting police officer, you're talking around 90 plus thousand dollars a year, okay? 
for a first year cop. I'm not talking about training. I'm not talking about uniforms. I'm not talking about all of the additional costs. I'm talking about that salary and benefit. And you're saying four of those people would reduce overtime by half? If, if I simply do the math in my head. Then it doesn't work. Absolutely. Because when you take a look at the amount of dollars that we spend on leave, which, which they have a right to take, by the way, and, and God bless them that some of them actually do take days off of vacations, um, you, you're, I, I, I could quantify this. I'll bring it back come Chief, September. My, my frustration is that my recollection this time last year was that we added three police officers. You were asking for one and a half. Or we added two more. I thought we added three. The two, the two traffic units. And then somebody else. A dog? And no, no the we, dog. I asked for the dog. I didn't get the dog. <laughs> the dog, the dog. So, but I thought there was somebody we, we else. We asked for three, ma'am. You're right on the money, but you gave me two. You left the dog in the in in the dog pound. In the dog house. Yes, ma'am. Um, but that the and those two officers went to the traffic unit. They did not go to minimum staff. So they didn't do anything for overtime. Chuck, I would, I would like to sit with you and better understand this. I think there is somewhat. A, I, I don't understand exactly what you're saying because if it is increasing. Um, and you're doing the same thing as last year, I, I want to sit with you and just kind of understand that better why it is increasing. I, I, think I, that's I, what, I think that's what the mayor's question is. And, and, and I have no problems sharing all of this information with you all, but I could show you, and I think you all know me after 13 plus years, that we document every dollar of overtime that we use, and we document every place we use it. So there is a rhyme and a reason, sure. and, and, and the way our police department supports itself with the amount of manpower that we currently have allotted is through the use of additional personnel by overtime. And I cannot possibly provide the total amount of services that I do and walk away from this cost. I can't do it. And, and, and I'm not crying wolf, I'm, I'm, I'm crying real. Oh, I uh, think the, you know, the, we, we, we have always been tasked with keeping our TO down, our table of organization, our number of personnel. And I support you all for that. If that's the way you want it, I'm okay with that. But we provide a plethora of services that equate to a large police department. We are that little train that could. Unfortunately, that train is fueled by overtime. It's, 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 it's a fact of this particular way we do our business. If the manager or the council sees fit to direct the manager to have us look at our business and maybe reduce some of the services, maybe start charging people for in-kind services, we can take a look at all of those things. I actually, and I think we've had this discussion before, at least very peripherally, um, the in-kind services to me should also be part of the, any in-kind support that we are giving to institutions or non-for-profits. I, it's, I think it should somehow be, you know, if we are doing something with the Rotary Club, it should be part of that budget. I think that's so that people understand what the whole impact is. I think that's helpful. And I'm, I, I'm just saying in terms of getting a big picture, I'm not, I, it, you know, this is, this is friendly. It's, but, oh, I know. Uh, no, no, no. I, but I, I because, personal, because uh, it's, it's a pretty big budget. And I think people don't even understand. They, they hear in kind and they think, oh, it's free. It's completely free. And um, it's got a, a fee associated to it. And it's got, you know, taxpayer cost associated with. I'm confused. Do you think they, they should include it in their budget and and pay for it or just list it? Well, I think if we are gifting it because it's in kind, it's a it's a donation or a gift. It's part of their budget. It's being ignored completely. They just say, oh, it's in kind. It just, you know, it just fell in their laps. The village as a whole has provided a tremendous amount of support to many groups here in not just police services, but Firewatch service, uh, Todd services, public work services for cleanup afterward, things of that nature. I don't think and people realize that there are costs associated. There are always costs associated with that. 
that that comes out of me having to stand here in front of you all and take a whipping. <laughs> but I have to tell you, so, the overtime we need to work on that. And I, I we'll I'll be talk. happy to go we'll back talk. to the drawing table. And what I would like to do is sit down with every individual, and we could chart this thing out, and we could quantify it, qualify it, take a look at it any way you want to do that, and uh, see what we could come up with. I, I see it as not that complicated of a problem, unless there's some way that we're wasting money by having people on the payroll in the police department doing nothing but sitting on their butt, then there isn't any way to cut overtime. If everybody that's on the police force that's doing something that we need to have done in this community and we have to pay them overtime, then there isn't any way to avoid that other than cutting services in some way. And it's an, it's, and it's an absolute, it's an, it's an absolute fact in just about any business, and it was this way in my own firm, that it's always less expensive and more efficient to use employees on an overtime basis than to hire new employees for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're much more efficient. They're already into something and they just keep doing it. Number two, you're only paying their salary. You're not paying any benefits and you always come out way ahead. So um, our overtime, just I just calculated it, our overtime and the police department projected to be this year is 11.5% of the total compensation, not including benefits, the total compensation of all of the uniformed officers. I don't think that that's an outrageously high number. Yeah. And I don't think that it would take hiring too many extra people to blow right through that number. So we can do the analysis, but I don't see it as an issue unless there are people being paid for not doing anything. And I seriously I, I, I doubt that that's you, the case. I can assure you that that is not the case, number one. Like number two, we only pay overtime for work that's being done out there. I'm sure not of it. put a body out there for the sake of putting bodies. Um, but I'd be happy to have the. I, I remember, as a matter of fact, you're telling us that you were you were burning your folks out by making them work overtime because of well, doing the traffic, the traffic direct and, the traffic. and, and right. other that other stuff. The I understand, but there's and always so that, something that, that comes the, up. You're burning, so so get two traffic cops. And that, that was part of the conversation. And so I would have thought that because, one, we didn't want to burn people out, and two, it was excessive overtime, which, by the way, next year is projected to be more, that there would have been some relief, naturally. Well, overtime, we have, overtime will always increase when salaries increase. It's just a function of each other. So the, the, these, these, is, these are actual, these are actual, let me, let me just try and qualify this but that was the discussion. Time. These are hours work. These are people who are putting in the time. They're out on the street. These are the police officers, mostly sergeants uh, on occasion, because if a sergeant takes a day off, there is nobody to take his place. We have to backfill that position, regardless of whether or not we're at full staffing or minimum staffing, what, unless question. we're like on day shift. On question, day Chief. Shift, if our sergeant takes a day off, we have lieutenants to fill that. So we don't pay overtime for that. So we don't abuse what we've been given. And here's a question I think this might clarify. Do you pay time and a, do we pay time and a half for overtime? Or yes, sir, time and a half. Time and a half. So if someone gets a 4% pay increase, a COLA or whatever, correct. then overtime on that person goes up by 6%. Yes, sir. Yep. So we're naturally going to have, if we don't have a single hour of extra use of, of police officers on overtime between this year and next, overtime is going to go up. Because the, the, the final dollar amount, sir, you're absolutely exactly. right. Yes, sir. But not to, again, and, and part of my, my discussion and I wanted to raise is, and you were here on the dais last year, and the issue that came up with the overtime for the traffic detail and, and, and addressing the lights. And the solution was, well, it's outrageous that one, we're burning people out, and two, we're paying overtime for that, hire two more. We had a little bit of a misunderstanding. I did, too. I thought that these traffic cops were going to be at least partially directing traffic. As it turns out, they're not. They're enforcing the traffic rules. So what... You thought, I thought, ended up not actually being what we thought. 
So. But there's no one, but there's, but we don't have, we're not paying overtime for the traffic lights anymore, are we? No, we're so not. there we go. So there we go. Right. Did, okay. did you say that you added a new training this year yes. that yes. increased overtime? Our, 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 so the combination of that and Gary's our active wonderful math. training alone. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something fun that I missed? <laughs> no, she called it's, my, she said my math was wonderful. Oh. <laughs> She's in the uh, education part. <laughs> no, and I took that as a compliment. Um, but our active killer training is um, a direct result of the world that we live in. And the fact that all police departments are training in the same way moving forward now, because when an event occurs, everybody goes. And that includes if it occurs here, God forbid, we're going to need those people to act like we do. And if it occurs right across that bridge, all of us are going, and we're going to have to act like they do. So this is a component of policing nationally that is the new <clears throat> world that, that we're all living in. But, and so, again, because we're so minimal staffed here, minimally staffed, all of our training is done on overtime, and I can't do anything. And is this part of the DOJ burn, burn grant? No, 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 no. And don't forget, our, our grants are $2,000, $3,000. We, we have applied for multiple sorry, COPS grants in the past, uh, multiple federal DOJ grants, and because the village of Key Biscayne is blessed enough to have the uh, income as a community that they do, uh, we don't even get looked at. Quick question, yes, is overtime start after 35 hours or after 40? 40 hours, ma'am. Allison. But our, our, our cops are 40 hour week. Your cops are. Okay. Allison, this isn't my night. So what I was trying to get at is between the additional training that you've added, which yes, is funded sort of by overtime, not funded, but, and then the additional salary increases that you, you, you feel that's why we're seeing this increase. That is absolutely why. I, I, I've got it all on paper. I'll be happy, like I say. And then I have one second question. Yes, ma'am. With the addition of the two traffic cops, do you see less of that feeling of burnout among the other officers? Well, we actually have seen a lot less burnout on all of our cops. We're not forcing as much mandatory overtime on daytime right now because we're using multiple resources to do different jobs. On midnights is where we're seeing a lot of our overtime, probably the majority of it, and the special events that we have. I could tell you this, Labor Day, Memorial Day, uh, Fourth of July, name the holidays. We are Easter weekend, the tennis tournament. The tennis tournament is thousands of dollars in overtime. We need those traffic cops out there. We get nothing for that. Why aren't we doing an MOT with Miami-Dade? Why aren't they providing that? They because, sure make a lot be, of money. Because we're not out there on their streets working with them. And they are not going to pay our overtime. The reason that we put people out here and staff our traffic signals and have moving traffic cops during these major events is because our folks deserve to have an opportunity to get in and out of their city. And it's necessary, you know? And, and I can't do that with minimum staffing because if I put people out there and they're on calls for service, we're pulling them off what we're tasking them to do. It doesn't work. The math just doesn't equate. Maybe David Beckham will pay for it. It depends on what city <laughs> you right. want to use for overtime. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure Miami-Dade cops will come in. To yeah, they'd be happy to if you want to pay them, man. Just Remember one what happened before 93? You had them here. I shouldn't say that. Listen, that I, I'll tell you a funny story about Miami-Dade wanting to come back in. Okay. I said, no way. <laughs> Single question. Yes. Some of the training requires groups, correct? Correct. As opposed to individual cops. Yes, sir. Requires groups. So the ability to just, if there was another cop per shift, the ability to deal with some of this training wouldn't be addressed at all. No, that, that part of it will not be, but the leave, vacation, sick, comp, Kelly days, those types of things would absolutely be reduced in terms of overtime, backfill, because we would be able to have our minimum staffing 
and still allow people the time off. I project that your burned, payroll that would go up right. by twice as much as your overtime would go down. That's right. You did that. Gary, uh, that's Gary's logic boss, is on the sale loss. I, I, I said that at the beginning of this whole discussion. It's really where you want the money to be right. or where you want the services to come or the services to go. Um, and I think we provide a heck of a lot of service yes, uh, and some really good service. So. I uh, hate to use the phrase cost of doing business. But. Brett and then Allison, and maybe we can go move forward. Yes, sir. Is the end of your, would you call it a beating or? A uh, whipping. A oh, whipping. whipping. Okay. Whipping. All right. Well, one small thing, money. just for clarification, repairs and maintenance of vehicles. I saw a 23% increase. We have new vehicles coming. Is it more That's a great or? question that that person next to you asked me already also. So I'm already prepared to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> we still have an aging fleet. We still have uh, 11 vehicles that are close to or in the 100,000 mile mark. They are seven, eight, and nine years old. We didn't replace all the old cars this time around. We broke the budget cost in half so the CIP wouldn't be hit hard. Now, we don't just make up these numbers. We have a fleet manager in the city of Miami Beach that knows every one of our vehicles from the moment they get here until the moment we get rid of that car. And they evaluate for us what we're probably going to be looking at in the future and our costs. So as I explained to Ms. Petros earlier today, these are guesstimates based on how they look at longevity of emergency vehicles, et cetera, and so forth, what we can normally expect of everyday wear and tear, and then the big ticket items which start to occur on these vehicles after X amount of years and X amount of miles. I hope we don't spend half of that, but I've got experts telling me to be prepared to spend that. And I'll talk to you all about fuel also while we're on that subject. We get our numbers from Miami-Dade County on our fuel. County told us last year they expect to pay $4 a gallon for fuel over the year. Well, we have seen fuel go up and down, up and down, up and down, but we have to at least budget for what the potential experts are telling us uh, we're going to be paying out per gallon for fuel. Uh, and that was with the blow up in the Middle East and all of the issues that were happening there. Well, it's been quite the opposite. We've been paying in the low $2 for fuel. So you could see our year to date on some of our fuel costs, even marine fuel, which is almost double what it is for, for our cost for our cars, is, is substantially lower than what we were told it was gonna be. So we will come in way under budget on, on both of those. Would you feel comfortable uh, reducing the proposed to 100,000 for automobile fuel? On the what, ma'am? Vehicle fuel, line, 52 point. No, I know exactly which line it is. I will absolutely take it back, sit back with the uh, county, okay. GSA, and uh, same with vehicle. With, same with boat. When do they give you their estimate? Is it? They're 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 in the same process we're in right now. So they're already preparing for their county budget, which starts uh, same fiscal mm -hmm. year as ours. I actually have one more one question instead of being the defense here. No, if I could ask this question, Chief. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you have projected that your life, health, and disability insurance costs are actually going to go down by nine percent. What magic did you work when the other life health insurance is going to go up? These, these well, insurance these insurance rates are not the rates of the department. These are the insurance right. rates that were given to us by our carrier. I failed. I don't usually bring him here, but Mr. Uh, I'll have someone give you a call and explain that. Okay. But that uh, makes he, really he goes. No sense. He goes through the entire process during the first budget hearing. But beforehand, I'll have you and Council Member Petros contacted by him. Great. Same as Bob Holland. Great. Thank I you. was going to say I do a great workout program. Over there. <laughs> that should do it. I can't. I knew you'd found some way to take credit for it. I have to say something. Yes. I have to. <laughs> Uh, any other thoughts, questions? I, I just had a question about the decrease in the crossing guard outsource program. Yes, ma'am. Um, just, is it going down because we're getting less? That's because we, we have not actually gone and, and begun our safe routes to school. 
once we get that, then we will be at the full component of what that program proposed, which was the 18 positions. But is this from last year to next, or this current year to next year, the decrease, is that a, that's a less personnel. person? Yes, yes. And was that based on that, the suggestions? That, that's because when, when, when we proposed the budget, we were believing that we were going to use all of those personnel because we had this safe route to school program. But until we actually build the sidewalks and complete that entire process, we won't have a need for those extra crops. So it's not a decrease from what we actually experienced no, this past school year? No, ma'am. Okay, because people then, were very happy. And, and, and we're, we're, we're not only happy with it, but you're going to come in, uh, you should come in a little lower year to date for uh, this year also. I'd say summer is in, so this number is probably not going to change exactly too right. much, which is good. So we're happy about that. Thank you, Chief. Any Keep this flow going. I'll bring up the fire chief. Please. <laughs> he already answered all the overtime questions. <laughs> I'll find one. Please. His right. goes, his goes. You're lucky Chief Russell is out already. <laughs> he hates it. Chuck hates going first. Uh, I know. Deputy Mayor, Council, um, I can just say uh, thanks to the police department for Nerva Jean because she definitely helped us out the other day. We had a car broken down and I don't think I've ever had a vehicle towed so fast. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I have found value in her already. Um, jumping into my budget. Uh, the things that jump out um, under the ca fire captain's line item, we previously had four captains there. Um, we had a, a retirement of a 24-year employee, and and the fourth captain was redlined. So we said we weren't going to fill that fourth position. And the re reason that fourth position came around was the lieutenant was promoted, I believe it was 2012, and so we had six lieutenants at that time and three captains. Uh, we somewhat had of a rebalance uh, in mitigating uh, some labor issues. And uh, this is basically rebalancing our TO to what is normal and uh, what is an efficient system for us. So we have three captains and six lieutenants. And that's why those changes are reflected in those line items. Um, if there's any staffing questions, I can answer them now, or I can move on to overtime. <laughs> um, so jumping into overtime, um, we are projecting to be over a budget in overtime. Um, the next year's budget is projected uh, based on the actuals. I'm taking into account the idea of an increase in salaries. Uh, I have 13 senior employees. Uh, that are up for a 5% raise and a 3%, 2.9% uh, COLA raise. Uh, and so, so that is an attempt to project um, the actual cost. And I think that it's important to recognize something that Chief Press had mentioned. We did a lot of work on this on overtime. And to us, one of the big drivers of overtime is a function of staffing, which we talked about. Um, Ed London, who I really enjoyed talking to about about business, uh, he thought we were overstaffed. And if Ed's listening, I'd, I'm happy to talk with him about it. And he actually got us to do the staffing study. And what we realized that 35, we, 35 people were optimally staffed. It's pretty common for us to have, when I say 35 people, I mean 35, we have 38 uniformed firefighters. That includes myself and the two deputies. We have 30 five uniforms that are assigned to the response vehicle. We call that the line. So when we have 35 people that are on those fire trucks, firefighter paramedics, I can have an injury or I can have a vacancy and I can do okay. But the, but the less people I have, the, the more inefficient we become. And this year I've had the equivalent of, of up to six vacancies because of I've had, I've had two vacancies and I've had four people injured. And that's driven my overtime. And, um, and I've got that just to give you some ideas. If once we start losing about three people, um, we're, we're kind of flirting above the $300,000 mark. And, and actually, based on our model, we're doing pretty good. Our, our model should put us over $400,000 with six vacancies. 
sorry, with five vacancies. Are you in the same situation as Chief Press where you're running with minimal staffing or do you have vacancies that may help offset this number for next year if you get them filled? If I can fill the vacancies, yes, I'm going to offset the number. Absolutely. Um, but we, I, minimum staffing, that's the primary driver. Uh, ours, our magic number is eight. Um, we're, we're also very lean. If you go back to testimony year 2008, we restructured the fire department and we had more staff positions. If you look at other organizations, you have EMS chiefs and you have training chiefs, um, logistics chiefs, chief chief level positions. We don't have any of the support uh, levels. We just have our three chiefs, uh, myself and the dep and the two deputies, and the captains and the lieutenants that are on the line provide a function of um, for EMS, for logistical support and training, and it's a kind of a double burden to them. So I get a cookie or what? Yeah. No. no, you can kidding. take them to kids. So, you have to get your whipping first. And <laughs> okay. There you go. Wow. That's what that's what we were saying. <laughs> Man, <laughs> thank you, Brad. Uh, you are so <laughs> stern. Hey, Chuck started. Would you me. like a cookie before? I'm I'm okay. Uh, so uh, that's basically it. So I, is this projection based on you still having those vacancies far into the year? The, the, it's 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 projected on on. It's actually a very conservative. Projection of, of what our actual costs are um, with with most of the vacancies filled. I'll tell you, if I continue to have people injured and I have vacancies, you can expect that number to be greatly higher. And just to give you an illustration, if I dropped a, a level of six people, um, I'll be closer to $600,000 in overtime. Six, six vacancies, which would, would be a combination of injuries and vacancies. And applications are... More sparse, very, very sparse. I've never ha I, we, we we opened our application process early, uh, somewhat projecting uh, what happened last time, and we only the last year that we hired. I think I think last year we had a process that we started, uh, and um, I'm, we've, this is the worst showing of applications that we've ever had. What is the number? The number I've had, the height I think we had was uh, in the 400s. Uh, I'm like at 30 right now. And it's pretty normal for us to get 100 applicants for a process. And I've had, a, I've had an open advertisement going on on, on different online sites and, mm -hmm. and word of mouth and email distributions, and, and we're, we're struggling at 30 right now. Is the rate, I mean, 30 applicants means you may not find four qualified ones. What is your... Typical. It, it takes it, it. Really, we need about we need about thirty applicants to get per slot. Per, per yeah, we can, we can we can squeeze. If we're lucky, we can get two or maybe three out, out of it. We end up with kind of ten on the short list, and we we you know we really struggle. When I was we were putting our accomplishments together, we talked about one of the things we did that didn't necessarily make the short list, got cut. But it was we promoted a lieutenant, we we assigned a new driver, uh, we, we hired an administrative assistant, and we filled three vacancies, uh, and we also graduated a person from the academy. And I kind of sometimes you take a look and you say, "Wow, that's where all my time's going." It's in HR. We've just been we've been hiring, and it, it takes a tremendous amount of, of time. Um, we're we're trying to recruit, but it's tough. Thank you. Thank you. Have a cookie. I, I, I have think you earned your cookie. You earned your cookie. For the I think kids, I'm gonna have. Eric, I'm gonna have fun again. Kids, or they don't eat that. Jesus, continue. <laughs> His kids are healthy. <laughs> they don't eat sugar. How long have you been known that? That's what I just said. His That's kids it? are healthy. I retracted myself. Allow me to have some more fun, please. Uh, I'm gonna bring Chuck Press back up. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> You want more cookies? He, he and Tony are here to represent the public works budget. Oh, there you go. 
Is this presentation by Chief Press Overtime or is this regular? I think he's bringing. <laughs> I don't make overtime, sir, but I got to tell you, I am personally stunned at the short dissertation that the fire chief once again was able, was to, get able to get away with <laughs> in his budget presentation. You wore us and out. in my next life, you wore us no, out. No, you should still want to be the gunslinger. I'd never want to be the Just go second. Um, Your problem is that you are not a key rat. <laughs> Chuck. John wasn't the key rat. Your problem. He used to get away with even more. Um, uh, folks, uh, we're going to talk public works here, and I'm going to put on my other hat, and I am going to uh, beg your forgiveness if there are some things that uh, I'm not quite sure about. If I need a backup, I got Tony Brown back there. He's a tough guy, and he'll be able to come here and back me up. But there are a couple things in here that are really going to jump out at you, and that's a 14% increase in our budget, okay? And there's a reason for that. Um, when, when, when I started looking at our budget, uh, I talked to them about our everyday activities that we do in public works. Uh, our street maintenance, when we find a, a crack in a sidewalk, when we do this, when we do that, uh, when we get called out for a hole in the ground, a pipe that burst, things of that nature. And a lot of that was in the CIP. And I didn't feel that daily maintenance items are a capital project. That That's part of day-to-day -day operations. So what I actually did was... <coughs> I moved the money out of the CIP, uh, especially when you take a look at um, the transit line item, okay? And you see a $220,000 line item. That literally was taken from the CIP and now placed into your operating budget. And that is projects that are uh, uh, maintenance of traffic circles, sidewalks, street signs, roadway inclusive of pavers, asphalt repairs, painting of crosswalks, things like that. There are several maintenance duties that Public Works has to do every year to keep continuity with the projects they've already done uh, as far as their capital projects. And they're, it's, it's operating money. It's not CIP money. So that's your big ticket. Here. Chief, if you guys can in the future call that transit slash road repairs, because I thought it was fixing the freebies. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Slash road that's, repairs. That's been asked. Could I just say road maintenance? Yes. Yeah. Better. Okay. Thank you. What about workers comp? That's yes. A, that's a huge uh, I, I, I talked to Tony about that. And again, your compadre next to you, she ahead of you on that one. Uh, she asked me about that, too. It's a dramatic increase. Mm -hmm. Nobody in public works has been hurt. Nobody's been out. Um, I, I can't understand for the life it's, of me. It's based on experience. Based on what? Experience. Because oh, claims. My experience or claims. their experience? Claims. Okay. But what's a, what, what has changed from last year to this year to give a... It's a two-year delay. So the claims that have so occurred... That person that we had, uh, and I won't name him, due to go. HIPAA, two years ago who had the major workers' comp claim, that's now coming back to yes, haunt sir. us uh, in terms yes. of okay. costs yes. of the insurance? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, if, if we thought about <laughs> shopping this... Yeah, I agree with Darren. Because this is outrageously high, and I think it makes really good sense to shop all of our insurance every couple of years. It keeps our agents honest, and it shows us whether there's a more efficient way to do this. But I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with the overall change in our entire insurance package. I think it's out of control, and I'd be surprised if we can't do better. I'll tell you, over the years, and you'll speak yeah. up on this, we have faced, at the budget workshop, Every year I've been sitting here, a double digit, large double digit projected increase. And when we come back in August, the insurance broker with whom we work on, on um, health and disability specifically comes back and with a negotiated number that is a fraction of that. 
Absolutely. I don't know how they do it, but they do it every Because year. we ask and we push hard and they well, realize it, they've got to do it to save the business. But they deliver. And sure deliver. they do. But we do push. And we used to have Jim pushing and, and John has always pushed. And it's something that needs to be just and part just, of our practice. And just remember, Jim, Jim was a, a guiding yeah. force. But at the end of the day, he never recommended we go elsewhere. He always felt that after the long negotiations, these were good people. Um, we, we can go and take a look outside, and, and I can present to you. I figure out how to do that, but I'll do it over the summer while he... I've actually got a couple of companies you might want to just, very large companies you might want to call, just to get comparative quotes. And it may be by what, what uh, Frank just said, negotiating with Brown and Brown, mm -hmm. we can get a much better deal because... I found in, in my experience that when you get quotes on this kind of insurance, it's just a shot right out of the cannon. No. And I, I can and tell you that that's not what happens here, but I, I will. I'm not comfortable enough saying I can do better. I just know that what we have done has been done well and has been done properly and has been vetted by a good group of people. Let me take a look. Brown and Brown is a good weeks. company. I'm not criticizing them at all. Understood. I'm just saying – we got to try hard to do a little bit better, and I think we probably can. Yeah. We, we use a broker called National Marketing for our health insurance, and it's the same thing. He gives me numbers that scares me to death in June and July, but he's able to, and he's able to give me the comparisons to show me just how much better this process is versus others. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I got it. And Thank if you'd you. like me to help you with it at all, I'd be happy to do that. Well, I find you in town, yes, sir. Chief, the consultant. <laughs> <laughs> it's her last <laughs> meeting. She can crack up on the record. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's just to have in case of to be nimble. I don't. I know we used them um, in 2016, but I don't remember for what. Who? What is Tony. It? Tony. Which, Tony. Which item? It, it is item. Thirty-one point zero zero, zero. Thirty-one point one zero zero, right? Thirty-one. Temp point. help or consulting? No, the professional help consulting. It is budgeted forty-four five. Oh, bear with us. Yes, yeah, the first discretionary spending item. Yep. Thirty-one one hundred uh, consulting services, no, the offers and years others years. as per needed basis. Professional engineer, which is our GIS, and our environmental resources, which is our trees. I think it was thirty-one zero zero zero. I think you said thirty-one one hundred. Thirty-one zero zero zero. Yeah. But is that okay? That, but that's same what thing. it is. That's okay. the same. All right. Yes, sir. For the forty-four five. <laughs> okay. And then the other one, professional services self-assessment, which is the 31.200. And I think this is going to be generally, I saw it in a couple of our, di um, of our department um, budgets, and it's the discretionary. We had a couple of years back asked or uh, directed the, the manager in the different departments to do assessments. And what came back was a hybrid of self-assessments with the help of police and fire, and then uh, uh, assessments through consultants. And so it's a good time to follow up yes, across yes, the board. Absolutely. <laughs> and then let me see. I have a question for Tony. And this just keeps on coming up through residents and volunteers and what have you. And I have a black thumb, so I, I just don't even know how to, to, I, to even start this, but there seems to be confusion on behalf of the residents and some volunteers as well as to who's accountable for what when it comes to landscaping. We've got a horticulturalist, we've got a consultant who designs and is supposed to oversee, and we've got um, our landscape, high-end landscape, and I'm asked who's supposed to be overseeing who and who do you complain? I said, I have no idea. John C. I have Gilbert. No idea. John C. Gilbert. Yeah. But, and but, the, but so, Tony, how is, there, right. I guess because you oversee this, right. what, you know, what's your perception? Because you're on the ground, your boots on the ground. And so 
you're, you know, you right. would report, you know what's going on. Right. Well, Public Works, um, Public Works manages the landscape maintenance contractor, and we just hired a new arborist who will be going out to perform additional inspections that involve checking out the uh, health of the trees and making sure that they're getting the proper fertilization, which we did not have that expertise you know, in the and, past. And that they're pruned in the proper manner. And right. And, and is that a full-time position? It's a part-time part -time, part -time position. Is it in here? Yes. Yes. Oh, it's not, it's not a yes. It's not an out and so the question to me also, because this came up in the multiple conversations, and, and again, I just think trees are pretty, but um, why is it that the tree pruners don't do it correctly? Why is it that you need someone to oversee the expert tree pruners Well, in our, terms of hat racking and that whatever other? Well, our landscape contractor, he has um, certified guys that are trained to, to uh, prune, but uh, we had received complaints in the past uh, regarding the condition of the trees and that some were dying and we didn't know why they were dying. Uh, for example, over at Lake Park, we planted some, some palm trees, but the spray from the fountain contained like a little bit of salt water and during high winds that would blow and, and cause the trees to die. So we needed to bring in someone that had a more professional expertise on the health and the pruning of the trees to make sure that the structure is, is, is correct. And that they grow properly. The, the hat racking is is also is is a, different, is, a <laughs> is a separate problem. The and this gets back to enforcement. Hat racking occurs throughout the village, and once it's done, it's done forever. And it's a big problem. It happens repeatedly, and we're not catching it. And we haven't trained the private gardeners to right. what our code requires. And the same thing happens with tree removal. We're not catching it. But the hat racking is not happening with our landscape. No. My understanding no. was Sometimes. it was yes, Sometimes. and that was Sometimes. that was the frustration. Um, and and um, again, I don't know, but um, and and that's I heard that it's these professional tree removers that we hire for the swales and the public places that do hat rack. And I'm just wondering, you know. What is, how are they held accountable, I guess, is, is part of, instead of hiring two other people? Right, well, some, sometimes um, we've had trees that were hat racked by, uh, by residents, uh, the gumbo limbos. They were you know, messing up cars and destroying cars, and some residents took the initiative to, to uh, trim them, to, to prune them. And, <laughs> and, you know, they ended up hat racking them. Um, we are um, working on an educational program that will help residents with trimming on their own private property. But as far as trimming our trees, that should be left up to us and, and the experts. With this new arborist, he will be going out making detailed inspections. He has a um, complete landscape map, and we've already been out to do some inspections, and he's going to ensure that this trimming is done accurately, properly, and that the trees, the health of the trees are, you know, doing well. At the end of the day, I guess the question is, do you have the resources and the tools that you need to hold Here's people accountable and to have a, a, a segment of, of, of your department that works well? I mean, is that, do you feel that you have what you need? Yes, absolutely. And there's a hierarchy and people understand there's accountability, there's not confusion because that's, okay. We get, we get a number of questions coming in from residents and, um, you know, we fill them to the proper, you know, to, to the proper people. Sometimes we get questions regarding landscaping that is done by the landscape committee, and they do a great job. And sometimes we have questions uh, regarding the health of the tree. Uh, why is this tree dying? And so we have to rely on experts to come in and, and assist us on the health of uh, the trees. Do we have guarantees on trees? Yes, we, we Lake should. Park, Lake Park, yes. Yes. Okay, because reputable, uh, reputable landscapers or tree providers will guarantee them for a certain number. Right. The cypresses at Lake Park were, were replaced. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you said there was an arborist? Mm -hmm. Horticulture. Horticulture. 
We have an arborist or a we just we just hired a arborist. An arborist yeah. and, that's and in, where is that in our line item where here? Is that? 31.000 consulting. Oh, so we didn't. Okay, oh, they're fine. they're an independent contractor. Yes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And they're within that one. Okay. And so far, we have done a number of inspections, and we have uh, some trees pending over on Cypress to look at, to uh, because they they have scale. Yeah. And we treated them, and and the trees, they're they're not responding to the treatment, so. This guy will give us some additional information to assist us. Thank you. By the way, just so you know, that GIS position that we're looking to bring on, uh, that would be a tremendous bit of help for what we do here in public works. Yes. Because it identifies everything that's ours. And that's from trees to lights <coughs> to lamps to this to that, poles. And so when we need to take a look at our arborist, what trees are ours and, and what he's inspected, we can, you know, uh, be able to track all of that and be able to provide you all with much better information right. with the use of that person. Okay. And we, okay. we also have the, um, all of the trees in the village have been GIS, so we can record them and track them better when they're being removed or damaged. The GIS person will be a great uh, asset. Any other department. questions? Public works? Thank you. Thank you. Next would be parks, parks and rec, athletics, community center, Bueller, Bueller. What, what? It's like a surprise. It was the next page. <laughs> Here's Todd. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Here to answer any questions you have. Uh, anything I can't answer tonight, I'd be happy to give you a detailed breakdown and report on uh, after this meeting. Whoever's planning to do tuition reimbursement, I salute them. Good job. <coughs> Two students Good. currently enrolled. Good. Can you, start looking can at you talk about the teen programming? You want to jump to that? Oh, well, you want to stay in the salaries for the discretion? That's fine. We can I, stay up here in the non-discretion. Workers' comp is the same issue, I think, right, is we'll that universal issue. Yep. And so, yeah. I'm just jumping through. Whatever you want to start on, that's fine. We can go to the team program. Um, we, we added some team programming this year, varying success. We did some big events and small events. We tried to do some field trips. Um, it's clear to me that we need to get more involvement from our teens because we tried to do a lot of different things and we didn't get the response we want from them. So I have a budget number in front of you, but I really can't defend it without having spoken to the teens yet. I would like to start meeting with them and talking ideas with them, letting them know that I have funds available and report back to you, let you know what we're doing and how we're doing. The feedback I've gotten, and it's, it's you're going to get more, is they don't necessarily want field trips. They want to be able to use the fields and to do the pickup, you know, flag football or, or, or things like under the lights at night, that they can do just more playing. And I understand that. It's less structured. I think we can leave the lights on. I think I can pay some people out of this to o open the side door at the gymnasium and monitor the gym open until midnight on a Friday or Saturday. And maybe that will give us an opportunity to interact with them a little bit and say, Hey, what else can we do for you? The other thing I think we're having a challenge with, and you guys, you would know better, is our mode of, of communication is not trickling down to them. They're not finding out, and I guess. I think sometimes they are, but I think that really they have to be the drivers of this. Because even if they hear about it, when it's coming, you know, when it's being planned by, like, a grown-up, sorry, Todd, it's not <laughs> cool. So... I think I think that's those are really solid ideas. But it's exciting. Thank you. One of the thoughts um, when Todd and I were speaking, you know, one of the things that's not included here is the program that has been requested for the kids that have special needs, and then we have that Alzheimer presentation that we saw, which isn't necessarily included in here. And one of my thoughts was to give. Todd, who deals with many people coming up throughout the year, is to have an item of new programming. 
and to have a budget for new programming that gives him some flexibility to try and do different programs. You know, he he line item teen programming, but maybe we need new programming and that would allow him to then come back and let us know what should stay and what shouldn't and move forward on that. And are we gonna have a business plan of, you know, target audience who, you know, it needs to be thought out. Because one of the things even with, with the special needs, which I think is fabulous, I'm wondering, you know, have we reached out to Best Buddies and to a couple of other organizations that may already have the infrastructure? And I know it's Special Olympics, but in conjunction with, are we doing, who's going to connect all those dots? Well, I think I see it as a two-step process, which is the first step is these almost pilot ideas. And then if it were to move out of new programming to a line item, then it would have a budget. We would have a we would have knowledge. So the first year you get almost an experimental, you get experimental flexibility to try to meet these needs of things that have been brought forth that seem like good ideas, and then they have that expectation before they become something that is in our institution. Was there an amount that they asked for for those for those two programs? Just which curiosity. Which two? So the the uh, the Special Olympics type program and the uh, brain. I think the brain is coming back. Brain. She's going to. Right. She's going to come back and bring. She that's right. She said she was going to. She wasn't come sure back. that yeah, she needs see to how much sure. they need. Uh, the Special Olympics. I think. Do you have a, a ballpark idea of what we're that facilitator would cost? We're, we're interviewing some people now to see what it would cost to have somebody come out uh, two days a week. Maybe on the weekend. Special, that program seems Olympics. like it. The majority of it's paid for by the Special Olympics. The equipment. The equipment, right? So it's just the need that we see that having a facilitator would make it successful in our community. As the, as the people that came before you indicated, a lot of people are willing to volunteer. Sure. But nobody can take the responsibility of being there every time. You know, half an hour before to set up, staying for the duration. I think we have a. A volunteer base and it's also going to give us a great opportunity to see this population within our community and what else we can do for them and if there's significant numbers that we haven't uh, worked with in the past it's, it's there might be there might be some clubs or organizations here in Key Biscayne that may want to take on some of that as a possibility I think the volunteering part but I think Oops. with everything we do in the community center it comes down to the person who's in charge the ownership component. swimming's successful because of Iggy you know, it's not because everybody wants to swim here. It's driven by no, the instructors, and that's yeah. that's really key to the success. I mean, there's going to be a lot of volunteer help, but that's essential. So in September, those two items we may have I think we can include something the there I, in, in the new my, program. My recommendation, and uh, Miss Biggers, when she was discussing the Brain Club, she stated that the Brain Club would, through the Easter Seals, would run approximately twenty-five thousand dollars a year. But she also said something about offsetting a cost by twenty dollars per head, and getting to the point where it's twenty is recovered. So we're talking something in the neighborhood of five thousand, six thousand dollars. But she also maybe a little bit more the first year. Strong, and I'm all right. And, and she said she was going to go to the condos to see if she and really see what she could do. That people who don't need the service think it's a great idea, but she needs to really go and identify whether there is people will use it. The ones oh. who need it will use it. That's actually when she first came to me and talked about it, she was thinking fifty thousand, and I suggested she really needed to hone in on how many people will actually sign up, and then let's figure out what we can really charge for it. Because if other communities are charging forty to a hundred dollars, why should we charge twenty? And my thought is, if there are enough people interested in it, we can probably make it almost a self-sustaining operation. We may have to front the money. But I think we can probably get it to mostly pay for itself. And that's what she's setting out to do now, to find out if we can do that. That's a really good strategy. Thank you. That's a very good strategy. Makes sense. How do you feel comfortable with this idea of the new programming as a line item and then as things are successful, taking them out and yeah, making absolutely. them? I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. We'd have too. to determine. Thank you. We'd have to determine a quantity, though, that that we're comfortable with for that item. Well, and, wouldn't we be looking at what's like those type of things that might be coming up? Or are you thinking that that's a line item for things that may come up six months from now that we have no idea what it's going to be? I think 
you would want a little flexibility there. I think the teen programming would go under that. You know, he's he's put 35000 in for that, which if we're doing unstructured things, we may not even come close to that cost. But again, you know, changing that to new programming, maybe adding a little bit more money given these other two programs we're discussing. And then with an understanding that you come back and you give us specifics, what the targets were, the numbers of people that have participated and in, in your experience on the success of those and what the real costs are. This, this brings up a question I have. Um, the first time this has happened to me, we had a lot of presentations this evening for new programs, and there were a lot of budgetary numbers thrown out there. Is there any program that any one of you as council members is strongly in favor of? Uh, I will of be the presenting. Special Olympics. I will be I presenting. I'm in favor of both of those programs. And the Brain, yeah. the brain, yeah. Yeah. And the brain Club. I yeah. like both of those a lot. What were the other ones? I, those well, we, we had the Avatar program. Oh, the Avatar. Did we fund that? We funded that last year. We funded we, it last year, and it's the same. It's the same amount. Okay. Yeah, but it was over there in the youth. What the I would remind you, else. that's not children that live on. That was island. my concern. <laughs> is I'm it wasn't you children who live on Key Biscayne? Did they I think they on operate Key on the Key, and a lot of their members are. I residents. guess I'd like to know how many members they have. That that program's funded by the foundation. So. Okay. Specifically, it falls under that line item, so it's not separate in the side. But didn't we fund them $4,500? Yes, we did last year. The they did theater. They did a business plan, but it was driven by Key Biscayne kids. So I was a little surprised. And I just, I mean. And that's not an insignificant amount of money. I mean, I don't know. It's I just would want to know that it's, our, you know, that our community is, is, are the members. So maybe they come back with a little more information. Yeah. In the <laughs> when they presented last year, they presented with some Key Biscayne kids, too. City oh, Theater is under you? But this time it was, and that just yes. City that, theaters under under Utah. Do we have the the given our presentations tonight? Do we have the outdoor equipment in here? We have a CIP uh, allocation of eighty thousand dollars. The specific one mm -hmm. that she was referring to, I have a cost estimate at one hundred and fifteen from Calvin Giordano. For how many pieces? It was eleven or twelve pieces. That's a lot. But the problem was is if you do it next to the bathrooms, you have to raise that whole right. area. So it's not like a put in puddle. Ah, uh, okay. So does that include that raising that yes. that piece? The whole thing. It's like making a mini outdoor gym. Exactly. To nuts. And it would be raised up. Is it less expensive to disperse it around the track versus putting it all together or I mean then you're gonna do a bunch of surfaces everywhere. So, so it's better to keep it all together. I think, I think it's you can do either, but I think you're gonna too. be close. Yeah. Because you're gonna do if you do 11 pieces, you'll do 11 separate surfaces. I mean, my other concern about this is taking more grass from the village green. Amen. So we may need to try and analyze a different location. When, when you go look at these examples of um, these installations, John and I went to look at one. It just works better when they're clustered. I agree. When they're all spread out, it's a whole different thing. Um, so you that. get the networking and, and the, and the you know, companionship. We watch people close talking. When I got to take 25 steps and then 50 steps and 16 steps and come back around, I think you would want it closer in. And that's the successful ones that we looked at. Remember when we did our sunshine meeting actually in the sunshine? And we looked at various sites in that part, that little section mm -hmm. in between the playground and the community center. Yes. That grass area that's not used for anything, and it's not even really grass because it's got so many shade trees. We thought that might be a really good area for it, um, which wouldn't take any green space that's used for anything because it's just not it's just there. There's another little carve out right by 530. Yeah. Five that three. is looks like a continuation of the SunTrust parking lot. Mm -hmm. That is a space that could potentially we be We actually used. looked at that, and that, that would be something that wouldn't interfere with 530. No. Right. If, if it would fit in, and if it if it didn't interfere with anything, that would be a great spot for I it. think so, too. I yeah, agree. yeah. And we'd be avoiding... And I always the liked community. it next to the community center, which has got the gym there. I thought it would be a continuation. Thinking, yeah, then I started to get sold. I'm yeah. by the water fountain in the bathroom. So. Yep. All I need is a pull-up bar. 
Is it? It's lovely? already there. Is it? Or why don't we, what would you use it for? <laughs> Good clothes. Good clothes. Good idea. It would be interesting if it would be less expensive in that little area next to the Sun Trust. To see what long. the price is. If we don't have to raise it up, it's like, well, that's not definitely be less surface. I mean, you it would be a lot less. Exp- it would yeah. be less expensive. You have the money somewhat earmarked this isn't the meeting to have a discussion of the Correct. location of the fitness equipment i don't think but no but it is a discussion definitely. on the cost and the cost of it could be much different if it's in one place versus the other yeah, which would be really good to look at it amount anyway okay. two repair and maintenance issues one i have to tell you was a little disappointed that the maintain that fields had only been maintained to the tune of one hundred nine thousand. We had allocated 260. You're going to see that go up. Okay. And the next is. Can you see that? Repairs maintenance artificial turf. Yeah. The delete mast for the village green end mast. Thank you very much because I thought that was a little steep. Can you, can you speak to what? Glenn Waldman was talking about and what your feeling is on that issue of whether we should be charging a fee or not and if that's going to have a significant impact to the cost per child incubating. Uh, um, when it comes, look at it this way. Everybody in the community center pays an impact fee. Athletics have always been treated differently. If you want to keep that going forward, we're fine with that if you think they should be paying an impact fee towards the maintenance of the fields and everything else that takes place. You can do that. I mean, 30% of everybody's activities in the in the community center will come back to the village to help support the community center and its operations, maintenance, and it basically covers the entire budget of the community center. It's self sufficient. Um, this will, will never get to that level, but it, it's some kind of <coughs> give back to the city for the facilities and the maintenance. And this was I mean, added. Can, real quick? can I? Can I just? Yeah. yeah if I can elaborate that. on that a little yeah. bit, when the Youth Athletic Advisor Board was created, there were certain kind of policy um, issues that were explored, and one of them was to whether they should charge or not for playing fields. And the policy that was adopted by that was recommended by the board, adopted by council at the time, was um, for sports that are in season and travel or recreation and there were some caps on how much season you know travel yeah. but but That's you don't charge that but when you have sports that are going year round in our travel then that goes beyond the kind of the public purpose of parks and recreation and they should pay an impact fee and and if you have a private entity running a camp during the summer and it's a for-profit endeavor then that's when they pay and so there has to be a distinction of and and part of it is if you know you're always going to have the elite players playing year-round but sometimes parents just want their kids to be in a sport and and so if the rec sport that is a little more relaxed is more affordable you, that's why you don't charge the impact fee for that but then you'll have more kids playing basketball you'll have more kids playing baseball and they'll try the different sports and 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 so it's part of so you don't cannibalize but also for those sports that are doing intense year round in other communities that so that's that can, was can we make sure though that the programs that are recreational aren't have being hit by that because obviously the soccer department the soccer program handles both recreational and and the and the year round and we'd want to make sure that they didn't impact recreational and they did impact if you look yeah. at how I broke it out that the impact that they're going to get is pretty minimal I looked at what other cities do some do 20 percent across the board that's like a Pinecrest example others do a per registration fee every time you register for a sport you pay, but I found those to be unequitable because they didn't they, they didn't have you pay a fee commensurate with how much you use our facilities. So I didn't want, you know, yes. everybody who plays mm -hmm. a sport that plays on one field all season long shouldn't pay the same as somebody who uses eight fields all season long. They both be playing 20%. So I tried to manipulate that. You could change the numbers. I mean, if you went to 
on the, the first group and put that at zero, you pretty much take all the intramural support and, and they wouldn't be paying. How do you handle the adult? That's adult soccer, so you've included it. Yes. I've included everything. But we can. So, it, this is just a starting point of this discussion, you know, here at this workshop. We can move this in any direction you, you see fit. Yeah, and there so was. They currently pay nothing, nothing. And like Maria Verdeja does the 30%. Yeah. yeah. So that's part of the challenge. Um, if you recall, KBAC days, it, there were some subsidies for the sports programs. We've been operating them to be self-sufficient. If at any point in time they're not, they have to adjust their fee structure to return to self-sufficiency. Like our building department. Yes. <laughs> not as controversial. <laughs> on the fee stride. On the fee side. Okay. Some of these are, are for-profit entities, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Which ones? Just no. soccer? So soccer is, I mean, there's other incorporated entities that operate a program, and but we pay them a, a flat fee. But which is the for-profit and which is the non-for-profit or the kind of? The youth soccer is. Um, is basketball still? They were at one point at least the managing. I don't remember. I don't know what they do. They pay a management fee for somebody who manages it. Uh, but most people, when you say that, most people incorporate just for tax purposes, and so they're basically a for-profit because they incorporated and have a corporate name, but they're, they're just a management fee. Same with volleyball? Same with volleyball. There's an incorporated name. I thought flag football was all volunteers. Oh, it is all volunteers. Okay. And what is lacrosse? Oh, no, I'm sorry. We paid some coaches. But you're managing it in house. Manage in house, paid some coaches to get. Who do you manage in house? Uh, baseball, adult softball, adult soccer, lacrosse, and flag football. Okay. And also, they, they deal a lot with this. Just because of, there's an entity involved with the sport doesn't mean that we're not. We do all the schedules for soccer. We, we hold the soccer flag for this community. It's not if the comp the companies can change, the village organization that does the scheduling and the managing is still us. Now, do you have any of these entities running private summer camps? One is having a summer camp that isn't charging. One is having a summer camp that is. Who and who? Field hockey is not charging. Soccer is. And where is soccer? Mass Academy. And do they have, tell me about the schedule for that. I think it's Monday through Thursday, like in the morning, and then there's another session in the evening, each about two or three hours. Now, if they're going to use, I mean, that's a for-profit summer camp for a couple of weeks. Are they going to pay a rental fee? Like I said, in the past we haven't, but if you want to say everything that happens in the summer 70-30, that's easy for me to implement, and I'm happy to do it. I just think it's a private for profit company that is running a summer camp that's open to everyone and they have no overhead. I don't know why our tax dollars should be our taxpayers should be paying for overhead for somebody. I'm happy to do it. I mean is that am I No, I don't disagree with you. I do think we need to come up I mean, with something it's, that's it's, consistent. It's consistent with what everybody else says. But I, I would I would think that the summer camp model is completely different than then the recreational or, or I mean that's just a completely different these programs where you pay yeah, like an, I, I, when you pay a manager it, it's, they just have a salary it's a, it's a, or they have a percentage of business they just have a salary okay it's a camp so the enrollment it doesn't affect exactly <sighs> have anything to do with the soccer camp. camp that runs on the beach. I would think no, we so. don't. We've been talking to I mean, no, there's uh, code enforcement about that. Cost associated with the use. Because they, we there's don't no have insurance. We don't have a permit. And, I don't know, and in fact, are they using lights? Do we charge when it's not a a, a sports kind of one of our Sorry, leagues or team? I, I, I was I, answering that uh, question. I am so sorry. Your I, no, I was my not, own little. You're fine. It, what is the policy for running lights? Let's say I want to do you know, something 
really athletic and private on the field. And, I mean, I mean, do, what it, how much does it cost, let's say, to run the lights for someone who wants to do a, a good program under the lights and it's private or it's, you know, it's, it's not sanctioned and enrolled by our parks and rec? The only example that I could think of that that is like sometimes we'll try to like let the Frisbee guys get out there and play because they're part of our community and it's so restricted the opportunities that they have to play. So during the year, if there's an opportunity, we can get them out there, we'll get the lights on and we don't charge. Shouldn't we know though, for people that are interested in using it and renting, what the fees associated with running the lights for two hours are? We can, we can mirror, the, the county has a fee structure for the, for the field and then the field with lights. You, you can look the Mass Academy, it's about 12,000 a year, I think for the entire year, it's about $1,000 a month. They divide that out by the hours we use it and kind of get an idea of, of, of what it costs per hour. Is and there I, an interest in that? Like, do people want to use it? I think the soccer camp is doing it. Is, but the soccer camp's during the day. I, I, I think we'll, doing it at night. if we go 70 30, I think we're going to cover. That's what I was thinking. It, it yeah. seems we'll very complicated to break this all up. Just but if you're doing it, I mean, during the day is a different expense. Again, I because I see this happening. I, mean, I just think it's good to have a good policy that is clear and equitable. I think it's not right to have taxpayers pay for the lights for. I would hate but to get it's into serving the tax. They use the pool the and the pool's more expensive. Not necessarily. It's open square foot than the uh, dancing aerobics room. Why is their fee the same as ours? If you got, you know, that's, Leave the that's pool a, out of it. Well, because <laughs> so the question is, and that's absolutely right. What is the cost of maintaining and running that versus running? I mean, there's there has to be a, a, an analysis of the cost associated with that use, and it's not arbitrary. It's because, well, you know, it is. It is it is nominal fee to um, use the the bricks somewhere where it may be really expensive to maintain um, the pool, which may or not be expensive. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just different. But I think if you have a a seventy thirty policy that works, right? Like I was seventy thirty when I was yes. forty five minutes in that one little room, and it it worked. That's what most community has. They were across the board. Some people are in one area for a little while and in another and then in another area and but then Miami like, okay, Dade this has is the fee structure for this room for the night lights do you think there. there should be if it's private? Well isn't it's it the rental? same organization running the night and the day? Yes. So then it should be just a general fee that it comes and you know includes both See if you had someone costs. who wanted to come and hold one event one night, you you could look at charging them for the cost of the lights, but I do think if you're looking at dealing with an entire entity like the soccer program, and they're there during the day, they're there during the night, just for the sake of <coughs> just making it Todd, easy to administer. Could, could you go back and propose something then for, for us? Or? Sure, absolutely. So maybe the best way to do it. I think, I think the summer camps are to hear what happens yeah. on the night. Excuse me? I think they were yeah. yeah. No, I again, if we have limited resources and we're paying heavily to maintain them, we just have to be sensitive to all this stuff. I think also we can listen to what happens Monday night and hear mm -hmm. Joe when he weighs in from, from that meeting. Okay. okay. So on the community center? Next. Did we do it already? I thought we did all yours already. Two more. He's got multiple. He's got uh, community. Yeah, we jumped to athletics and we went back to community center. That was a revenue line. Only. Did you have, I don't have any questions except for, is the facilities <coughs> in the cleaning? We're going to need another field trip. I mean, right now, I mean. Just find the clean ones, please. <laughs> but this is, but we are going to need a field trip. Um, athletic division? I think we kind of covered it yeah, in terms of, good. okay. Thank you. All right, moving along, if I made to the special revenue fund budget, that takes care of all the departments. Mayor, this is yours. 
this is primarily the CITT and what you have learned and what we will be able to. What I have learned, which is based on the discussions here from the dais and guidance from council, is that, and, and from just a history of trying to um, tap into the CITT monies in a legal way so that we're not then penalized, is that the whole use of this transportation tax is evolving and we were on the cutting edge and doing an app-based, technology-based app so that it's efficient and there's a recognition from many communities who are in the same position that it is far more efficient to do a modified hybrid circulatory or kind of need-based um, transportation system instead of a pure circulatory um, because it may be that you have the circulatory running for hours with very little um, usage and, and, and where if it was running directly from the community center to the end of the island, that's where the trips are generating and that would be the best, most efficient use. So there is um, a, a proposal to, a, a proposed amendment to the, um, the statute that, that dictates how the money can be used and um, it is in committee and then we'll have to go to our Miami-Dade commissioners. But there, it, this again is driven by many municipal by several municipalities. Um, they are in the same predicament. I think one of the, and, and from what I understand, the uh, proposed amendment contains um, the ability to use the CITT for senior transportation. Mm -hmm. It also um, allows for more app-based, um, need-based transportation, but it is it's on demand, on demand. Um, one of the things that they identified, which is um, that they, the CITT has done very poor, or has a weakness in, is in getting people to that last mile. So they have focused on transportation across the county, but that last mile people are just stranded. You know, lucky for us, this village is 1.2 square miles, and so that we fall within that last mile category. The idea is to be able to um, expand and, and really use, and they recognize that we're, losing, we're using incredibly efficient transportation that we are now limiting the need for more parking spaces. So all these benefits that they've been targeting for years, we're just achieving, and and so and a, a couple of other communities are as well. So that's the modification. Um, it's going through the process. Well, if I may, yes. Since you spoke with them, uh, we've heard from Nestor Toledo. He's took our pilot program. He has looked into our senior transportation. He was supporting everything that you were saying. He's developing our program so that it's part of the packet that goes before the BCC. I am extremely optimistic. And as far as the circulatory, we're down to one to two hours a day okay. as a minimum if we were going to do something. Initially, we thought because we're going around on the outside, the car, uh, harbor, Crandon, uh, back up in there. But we need to get more into the residential neighborhoods, too. And we were taking a look at from the old plan that we submitted to see if we could do that maybe twice a day. First thing in the morning to get some of the folks that ride a bus to Harbor and Cranon and then walk the rest of the way, we could instill them further in and we could be there for when they were leaving in the afternoon to come back to the, and that would suffice the circulatory pattern. Well, good. And they were, and yes, it's yes, more of an right, on-demand. Right. They were very excited about what this community is doing, what the foundation has been doing, and, and what the goals were. So um, hopefully we'll get some results. And I have to say, Mitch was fabulous. I think we're um, looking at September. Okay, good. We are, from what we were told. And I think from a council perspective, if we can all kind of um, unite our energies and, and, and speak to different com uh, commissioners when the time is right, I think that would be really nice to work together to get this done. It's a lot of money. I mean, it really is. It's uh, $500,000 that um, would really address what we are subsidizing. Would um, this go anywhere towards possibly getting the metro buses to stop as they enter here? And would we have transportation that would provide village-wide so Needs. one of the challenges, and that could be, but part of the, the challenge they have is um, that the metro buses are, are um, 
used heavily by people who are employed in this off in, in the in this office listen to me oh, in right. this village and the idea of getting them onto yet another mode of transportation oh. is not that efficient and so um it's to be addressed but that was one of the things that was raised is do you really want to get people who've been traveling for an hour and a half to then have to wait for another mode of transportation I, I thought, it's just something to think about i thought the what, what the discussion was is eliminating them from harbor but not eliminating them from crandon that's right they need to i mean stopping the buses at the circle and having them switch is not a smart idea but you know the ridership and i think we have to see a peak hour sometimes it's at each bus stop it's a lot of people that, that get on and off, and so it's, it's you know, when you've got a dozen people getting off in one stop, is that is the circulator going to do the job it needs to do? Because well, also having the two different routes increases the frequency of the bus, too. Correct. Correct. And these are they're tweaks, but that was one of the concerns. Mm -hmm. Just curious. Can I ask, and I don't know if this is the right time, but ha has there been any discussion of increasing the weekend hours of freebie? Just by residents. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and legitimate concerns, right? Like nighttime, safe, you know, there getting have been, home without there have getting behind the wheel. Residents who have asked, you know, would we be able to, and I don't know if businesses want to do this, but allow businesses to kind of cost share to get their patrons home from re establishments. Yeah, gonna... I don't know, That's but that's been asked by residents. And it's been asked as a found. I'll, I'll get some additional Yeah. Information. I, we had adjusted it one hour. <laughs> it's a mile. <laughs> no, but I, you know. Yeah. Okay. Are I carpooled with Tainter. Did you? <laughs> From these meetings? From work. <laughs> yeah. That's right. From work, you guys did. Yeah. That's nice. That was nice. Well, that's so that's that's that. our overview on the um, on the proposed special revenue funding. The stormwater funding is based on what we collected versus, and same with the solid waste. We'll have some additional and more updated information for you at the first budget hearing, but uh, we're on track with this. Good. May I read the cover memo on the CIP because this Please. should take a couple of minutes. And closes a preliminary five-year CIP for the FY18 through 22 fiscal year. For this budget workshop, I am recommending that we only focus on funding the FY18 projects. The attached proposed CIP includes three new recommended projects for FY18, totaling $575,000. The total amount of funds needed for the proposed projects for FY18 is $3,972,324 and will be fully entirely ah, and will be entirely funded by the excess revenue over expenditures in the general fund budget a reevaluation of all previous capital improvement projects resulted in a transfer and chief press alluded to this mm -hmm. in a transfer of three projects into the general fund budget in addition a total of four projects have been completed to date no final decisions are made at this workshop. Final action will be taken at our budget hearing in September. Here endeth the lesson. Do I remember the village hall is a million four, not a million five? The purchase I'm back. No, I can't remember now. I think it's a million four. A million five. Jenny saying a million five. Yeah. Yes. Closing costs, maybe soon. Maybe. Uh oh. Closing yeah, costs? Too. We. I don't know. There shouldn't be any. From our end, there will be. No, not closing costs. We don't pay. We don't pay tax. Right. There's no legal. It's just a deed. I think it's a million. Do you need right, we'll job stamps? Government. But you still have to do something, right? There's still some costs. An intergovernmental I think, I think it's exempt. I think it's is that two cost stamps. When is that closing? I could say, well, we'll as soon as the BCC approves it. And when is it going to be de on their agenda? Do you know? Not specifically. Um, I assume it'll be after their budget process. So. Do we need to work on that individually with the commissioners, or you think it's a done deal? Got it. 
How much did you guys budget last year for the underground utilities? Do you remember? Six hundred. It's there. Well, six hundred eight. Is that what's left? Uh, we, we've used some of it for certain things, or that's what we actually budgeted. Yeah, we had paid for the uh, the well received utility. <laughs> Feasibility, feasibility study out of the previous budget. So right now, I don't think we spent anything out of this. Ever. Okay. Other than that, no. No, that was right. it. When we come back, um, master plan initiatives. We, we might try to describe what they are. This is 2020 stuff, uh, isn't it? I gotta. Yeah, we're getting ready to. I'll be presenting in the first meeting, I mean, our August meeting. Our ear is up, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, yeah. And that process. We need to start uh, to do that. Chad and I have already had a very, very brief okay. conversation about it, but we're, we will be, and it's a little easier to do this time. Than we also wanted to revisit our master plan and modernize it. We do, and if we're going to do the ear right. It should be it. both together. In, in zoning. Yep. Yep. I, I think so just has, yes. so everyone knows, the year process that um, Frank's referring to, the, the law changed a couple years ago, and it's a, by state law. You guys can follow much whatever process you'd like, but the state law requirements are basically very simple to meet at this point. So um, you could follow what you did last time, but to meet the state law requirements is the only requirement is is that the village review its plan and make sure that um, it's updated to comply with new changes to the state law, which was not the standard um, last time. You guys Far more rigorous. But there's one. I don't. Not that I, but there's this uh, regional strategic whatever they call it action plan. The climate. You mean climate the, no? No, it's a South it's Florida, addition to the, the South, South Florida, Florida regional. Planning Council strategic plan. It's the strategic, whatever the hell they call it, and we've got a. Now that was just on the Miami Dade Commission agenda, and in, in adapting it. It's just we we need to just look at it compared to our zoning and comp plan and decide that it's compatible, and I think it is. Okay. But I think we need to speak to that. Okay, so. Correct me capital if I'm improvement wrong. If we projects. Yes. If we go back to the old way of the way we did it the last time, we would need to get started fairly soon. I mean, if you go back to the old way, I mean, you have to go through an entire examination of your plan and make sure that you've met every uh, objective, goal, and policy. And we don't have to do that. that. You don't have to do that anymore. But the one thing we want to do is look at zoning. We, we want to look at zoning. Zoning is outside of the year process, but, you know, it's, it's consistency is why it comes up. So we can finesse it and say it's compatible, but... It depends um, on how much we want to tackle. We may need to add an item here, and it may be premature or even a shot in the dark, but on this beach restoration project that we're looking at, if we can get the, um, the preliminary in by August 1st, which it looks like we're going to, and if we can get in line for state funding, at that point we're going to know, based on a preliminary design, how large this project is. And we'll be able to estimate at that point about what it's going to cost. And I think maybe Colleen can give us some indication of what she thinks we can expect, expect for reimbursement. But if this all happens, this whole project could very well go into this next fiscal year. Yep. And we hope it goes that quickly. Sure. If it does, it's going to be a very expensive project. And our part of it even is going to be in the millions maybe mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it, it's something we ought we don't know enough right now to put it in but i think we will before the september the end of the september workshops hearings rather i agree we need to we need to add that line item to capital but does, does and we have part the beach nourishment and building we have and a beach renourishment we're just going to have to instead of put the 250 thousand we may want to it's going add, to be, add a zero or two to that exactly it's going yeah. to be a much larger number so there. that needs to be and that is on the building zoning planning and Just public one, works two. ongoing projects we may want to add a line item this might be for um hot spots ongoing and then we may want to do for larger i don't know or, or but this is going to be financed as well right this will be over a certain period of time 
um, this project? It all depends. If 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 we get a major project approved, it will get done pretty much all at once. I would think. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's it's all it is is it's a four or five times the size of the project we just finished. And what did it take them, John? Three weeks, start to finish. Yeah, it's a, a larger project. I'm not optimistic that the shovel's in the ground the next day, but it is clearly a fast. Once we get funding, it's fast track. Yeah, for sure. Um, where are we on on the safe routes to school? We're we're funded and but we're funded, and what we have been required to do is to do the ADA areas that were identified, so that we can put the pads down, so that the around the school area there and the curbing around the school area there is all part of that design. I'm not as current as I probably should be on it, and I will have more information. I'll bring it back. I know that Mr. Joe has given me a call about this about five or six days ago, um, but we haven't really moved into it being given the authority from the school board to go ahead and move forward with it. They are still reviewing our plans, but I was told that curbing and the sidewalk areas around it, that's going to be another issue to bring back to council, and I'll try and do it in August. Um, just because they had put sidewalks there, I, I remember the conversation that that may not be where we want to have sidewalks put, or that just because they placed curving down wasn't where maybe we wanted the curving done. So what I need to do is to get you the projected plan, and we'll have that at the meeting, and you can take a look at it. That okay. was there was flexibility and, to that, and with the cost associated, because when when we walked with the school people, it, it struck me that the actual plan that we had, whether we did all of it or some of it would far exceed the the money that we got. No, well, I don't, the money that we got and the money that was in the, the rather lengthy book, the application was the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the application numbers, uh, if there's been some changes, I'll have to look into that, but we were, we were fully funded for what we presented okay. and what we believe the letter of intent was giving us to do. But we also stated from the dais and from up here, we would take a look at that because we would, we could add to it or make some changes to it, but it still had to go back. And I don't know where that go back is right now. Now I also see that there's a, the library planning conceptual design um, that may be moving forward. I know Frank, Katie, and I have spoken to different library individuals, and we hope to have some kind of um, you know next steps, mm -hmm. um, possibly in the fall. So um, we've got 285,000 encumbered, and I think um, we might actually have some traction on this. Mm -hmm. So well, let's just plan for that. Well, we've got the money encumbered already. Yes. So that should be okay. Yeah. Might we not be paying for the Village Hall parking lot this coming year? <laughs> we will be. But that's, in, that's already in, encumbered, right? I know it's it in here. But it's not shown as a fiscal year 18 need. It's on the. Um, it's an encumbered fund already. Oh, set encumbered aside. because it came from last. In the Not summary. construction, but the. You see assigned reserves on the first page of. It's, it's at the bottom of the yellow. No, I see oh, it. Yeah. But aren't we supposed to spread it as to when it's needed? It'll be needed. It'll be needed this fall. I mean, I think we'll. I think we'll close in the fall. So we'll probably need it in that first column. Mm-hmm. Well, it's in, it was encumbered, right? It's, yeah, this yeah it is. But, it's, it's money that's already there. Yeah, it's already there, so we don't need any additional no, money. Right. I just think it's a million four hundred million. Yeah, I said it's. We have a, a question about the. Exact that's for the purchase for money that's been put aside. Yeah. And okay. folks, as I see the Mast Academy turf replacement, and that we will be um, putting away yeah, one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. I think that's part of the idea of we have, you know, private programming or excessive programming. There should be some cost share right. because it's very expensive maintenance. And that's line item. Um, it's under recreation and open space. It's 125,000 a year. Basically, you're adding that up so that when we need to replace it, we have the money. Pro, yeah, yeah. We're we're. When we, we need, well, when we need, yeah. Okay. But it's based on wear and tear. Okay. Because you expect it to last how long? What well, is like the warranty on this? I think, I think, years, a, the, I think the life. Todd, what's the life? Eight span years right? of the of the mast field. What did they? What? Yeah, That's usually they're eight is years. Is there a warranty on it for if, if it, anything happens prior to eight years? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, you, Todd, you said, and, and John, um, that you had the exercise equipment in the capital, the CIP? 
I don't see it here. Oh, it's the exercise course, and it's eighty thousand dollars encumbered from before. Where do you see that? It is also on recreation and open space Third under item. the second non-operational oh, village exercise there course. It is. I see it. Where are you? All right. Yeah. Getting late. I know I was staring at it too. I just got my flash. And if you, as I made meant reference to in my budget document, I'm a the CIP under maintenance, you've got the master bridge at coming and the street light poles. The master bridge is 300,000, the street light poles is 150. And then, if you go further in, these add up to the $575,000. That was the mess that we're just talking about. So, all three of those items add up to the $575,000 that we need for just the new projects. Okay, so you've identified all three of them. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, this is work in progress, but it was extremely helpful. Thank you, everyone. I uh, do. I have a motion to adjourn the meeting. Me, a second. Tochita. Tochita. Congratulations. All right. That's exactly what they say. We're done.